All right, so um, yeah, so like I was saying, uh, this section, uh, or the part that we had finished was all the patient assessment, everything. And then it rolls into electrophysiology. Uh, and this whole you know slide for chapter 17 was like 400 slides long. Uh, I deleted about 150 of them uh, out of just the slides that we'll go through today because uh, the whole section that covers rhythm identification, we don't need to go back through how this textbook lays out rhythm identification. Um, so certainly look at that, certainly if you're still struggling uh, or if you just wanna read about rhythm identification and stuff from a uh, source other than the ECG's Made Easy book, you know, they might explain something in this chapter a little bit differently that clicks a little bit more for you. So don't overlook that section. Uh, you know, we're still gonna, you know, you're still responsible for that material. But it's all going to tie to uh, the ECGs made easy pretty well. Um, you know, this book might say less than 0.12 for your QRS uh, width. Uh, ECGs made easy might say less than 0 0.10, right? So there might be some small uh, minor changes like that, which are just, uh, you know, kind of universally common. Um, but it's nothing that's too crazy. And you wouldn't get a, uh, test question about QRS width, in which one answer is less than 0 0.10 and one answer is less than 0.12, uh, just because there's not one single universally agreed upon. Some people say that 0 0.11, 0 0.10, 0 0.12. Uh, so just somewhere in there is a number that you got to know. Um, so just remember that part for it, I'll say. Um, but yeah, a lot of this section uh, I pulled out. There's a couple slides that I left in. Um, just because I think it's pertinent uh, and particularly uh, kind of applicable for us. Um, so getting into it, uh, you know, we gloss over kind of some of the electrolyte uh, impact of how these things actually uh, work. Uh, when we're talking about that cardiac conduction system, uh, it was some of that extra stuff from uh, chapter one and two from the ECG's Made Easy book where we said, yeah, 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 we'll circle back to it. You know, this is kind of the part that we a little bit circle back to how these electrolytes are actually moving that are generating that electrical impulse that then gets uh, conducted through the heart. So depolarization, we know that one, uh, you know, that's electrical, uh, electrical depolarization, right? So when something is polarized, there's an electrical difference, right? So it's positive on one side and negative on the other side or even more positive on one side and less positive on the other side, right? It's just gotta be a difference in electrical charge. It doesn't have to be positive and negative. It can be positive and more positive or negative and more negative. Just as long as there's a net difference in electrical charge, if we give it a pathway through like those electrolyte uh, channels, like the calcium channels, sodium channels, potassium channels, those things, as soon as those open up, as long as there's a difference in that concentration, those electrolytes will move around. So even if that difference is positive to more positive, right, there is a difference. So those electrolytes will be able to move. Um, and that goes back to just the general uh, principles of diffusion, right? So it's still just general diffusion, right? Things will go from an area of high concentration to low concentration. Um, so they'll move purely just based off of how much calcium is on this side, how much calcium is on this side, and we allow a little calcium channel to open up for that to move, calcium is gonna move from the area of high concentration to low concentration, right? If we have more potassium on this side, only a little bit of potassium on this side, potassium will move high to low, sodium will move high to low, right? So uh, it all goes back to that diffusion stuff and just how much of these electrolytes are on which side of the membrane, and open up those electrolyte channels and you're gonna give the, the ability for those electrolytes to move through. So we open up all those channels, uh, electrolytes start rushing through, right? Now the greater electrical charge on one side and the lower electrical charge on another side starts balancing out, right? So it was polarized, there's a difference, and now it was depolarized because the electrical charge kind of uh, attempts to balance itself out. Uh, so the outcome of that is then it triggers that muscle fiber to contract, right? We can trigger all those muscle fibers to contract and we get, you know, the ventricles contracting, for example. 
Uh, so again, all just changes in concentration of electrolytes. Uh, and we know uh, some electrolytes are more impactful on cardiac functioning than others. Uh, so calcium is a big one, right? Uh, calcium, uh, you can think muscle contractility, right? So it's the big one in muscle cells firing, uh, specifically the cardiac muscle cell, but also your skeletal muscle cells rely heavily on uh, calcium's input. <clears throat> so you can think about if calcium is contractility, uh, what's the electrolyte, uh, and we carry it in our drug box, what's the electrolyte that then results in muscle relaxation? Anybody remember that one? Mega, which electrolyte in our drug box will cause muscle relaxation? There you go. A couple people chiming in. Mag sulfate. Absolutely. Um, yeah, muscle, uh, mag sulfate. We say electrolyte tocolytic. It's also a smooth muscle relaxant, right? So it works uh, very well in a lot of different circumstances. Uh, if you go back to your mag sulfate uh, drug profile, uh, you know, the indication, 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 there's a bunch of indications there. Uh, some of them were directly related to just the smooth muscle relaxation properties of them. Uh, so if we think about uh, the asthma indication for mag sulfate, right, we have those smooth muscles that are wrapped around the bronchioles that are causing that bronchoconstriction. So if we relax those smooth muscles, right, we're gonna cause bronchodilation, right? Uh, Preterm labor with the uterus, relax the smooth muscle of that uterus, and it's gonna stop the preterm labor, uh, or hopefully stop the preterm labor. And our preeclampsia, eclampsia, the, the big kind of driving uh, variable in that process is the hypertension. So same thing, all those smooth muscles wrapped around our blood vessels. If we can relax those smooth muscles, we get vasodilation, which is going to help lower that blood pressure, right? So mag sulfate is big on muscle relaxation. Calcium chlor or calcium, uh, which is why we have calcium chloride in the drug box, calcium is big on muscle contraction, right? So those two can play against each other. So if we were giving somebody mag sulfate and they went into respiratory depression, hypotension started getting altered we just over relaxed them uh, we did a mag magnesium overdose or magnesium toxicity we could give calcium chloride to try to start stimulating those muscle contractions back a little bit um, so that's kind of the outcome if, if we had too much magnesium on board you could give them calcium uh, which is a case you get a lot of uh, electrolytes if one electrolyte is out of balance a lot of times they'll try to start treating it with other electrolytes right they just try to balance those equations for how they work in the body uh, so calcium though is big on contractility <clears throat> so in depolarization right uh, you get that big rush of calcium ions right so calcium channels open up and all that calcium rushes into the cardiac cell and that's you know, the depolarization uh, or start of the depolarization of those cardiac cells. Uh, which is another one uh, that they uh, show here. There's a better one coming up that has a little bit more of it. Uh, but after it depolarizes, obviously, then the next step is repolarization. Uh, so if depolarization was the calcium channels opening up and all that calcium rushed into the shell, uh, into the cell, then repolarization means we need to close that calcium channel, and now we're going to have to start working its, its back out. Um, other ones that come into play are the sodium potassium pumps as well. Uh, so when we open up our uh, when we open up our uh, our calcium channels, the sodium channels uh, open up as well. Sodium rushes into the cell. Cal or, uh, potassium rushes out of the cell because those two kind of use the same channels. So sodium rushes in and potassium rushes out. So in repolarization, we got to close them. Now we've got to pump that sodium back out and the potassium has to get pumped back in. Uh, so it's a little bit of a step-by-step uh, a -step, uh, process. You see. So yeah, if we had... Uh, a different color on here, sorry. Uh, 
right. So if we had nope. uh, the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell, right? At baseline, is a extracellular ion and potassium is a big intracellular. So we could say this is at the polarized, just resting phase, right? resting or polarized. Right? So just kind of universally, um, oops, there we go. So again, sodium is big extracellular and potassium is big intracellular ion. Uh, so when those sodium uh, potassium channels open up when the cell is going to depolarize, and we also have our calcium channels. And so get calcium on the outside, sodium on the outside, potassium on the inside. In depolarization, right, so we're going to depolarize it. Calcium rushes into the cell, potassium rushes out of the cell, and sodium rushes into the cell. And that brings in a much larger overall positive charge into the cell. Right? And once you get that big positive charge into the cell, that's the cell depolarizing. Right now it has the more uh, positive electrical charge and you're going to get that electricity uh, that just runs through and causes that muscle contraction. Uh, then once it's going to go into now repolarization, calcium channels close, the sodium potassium channels close and now we have all that calcium inside that we need to start getting back out we have all of this sodium that's now inside and potassium that's now outside now the body the cells have to start pumping uh pumping that sodium back out and pumping the potassium back in uh, through those sodium potassium pumps and what that does is that now creates the big positive charge back outside the cell so that those membrane channels can open up again and allow all that electrolyte rush to move back inside. Um, let's see, whoops, sorry, sorry, sorry. All right, so the effect uh, that it has is here with uh, the action potential, right? And they kind of map it out against what's going on with uh your ecg which is just a good kind of side-by-side -side comparison and so what we have here if you're looking at it is millivolts right so just kind of electrical charge uh if you were looking at the electrical charge uh of the cells and the environment that uh that electricity is operating in and what you see is it's negative negative all the way up to zero and then positive electricity uh, so what it shows is the vast majority of the time Cardiac cells actually operate with an entirely negative electrical charge. Right? There's only a slight blip when you get the maximum electrical impulse of the ventricles with our QRS complex. There's only a slight split second blip where that cell actually goes positive before repolarization starts happening and the electrolytes start shifting again. So the vast majority of time it operates on a net negative electrical charge. Uh, and it really then becomes what I was saying earlier, which is as long as we have a difference, right, even if it's less negative and more negative, as long as there's an electrical difference, you'll get those electrolytes moving. Uh, so in this case, in the cardiac conduction system, it's almost always just running on a net uh, negative electrical charge. It's just varying degrees of more and less negative, right? There's only, again, that slight little positive bump, which if I had to ask you just kind of intuitively, if I told you, hey, during the ECG, there's only one moment in time in which the electrical charge inside the cell is actually positive, most of you would probably say the QRS complex, just because it's biggest, and you'd be right. Um, that's just the, the point of kind of maximal electrical uh, impulse and electrical charge inside the cell is when you're getting it happening through all of those ventricular cells. Uh, so we don't emphasize these phase zero, one, two, three, and four in the cardiac action potential much. Um, every once in a while, you might see a question on there and it might ask about 
the electrolytes and what they're doing during uh, a various phase. Let me just go back to the last slide I had it. So in phase zero, the cell depolarizes and begins to contract. And so phase zero is, uh, where are we at? That big initial phase. Right? So if we were saying the cell depolarizes, that's where we said all that calcium goes inside the cell. Right? So that's our phase zero is all that calcium goes inside uh, the cell. Sorry, keep screwing up my keystrokes here. All right. All right. In phase one, the cell begins to repolarize. Right. So that's the kind of downslope up here. All right. So phase one, right, immediately after the QRS complex, we know things immediately have to start repolarizing. Uh, just by the very fact that you know, heart's beating so quickly, right? Depolarize, repolarize, depolarize, repolarize, depolarize, repolarize, right? It's so quick that as soon as it depolarizes, there's no lag time. The heart's immediately repolarizing because uh, a second later, it's got to fire again, right? So that's your phase one, Cora. Um, phase two, then in that repolarization, uh, the sodium and calcium had entered the cell and the potassium flows out. Uh, and then it's, uh, that's going through that repolarization cycle, right? It's got to get the uh, potassium now back into the cell and the sodium and everything back outside the cell. Uh, and then phase four, phase four is then just kind of that resting phase. So it really just kind of keeps falling. It's repolarization and those electrolytes start shifting back and, and then everything's resting before it's gonna repolar or depolarize again and all that calcium moves. Right? And then same thing is just gonna keep happening, right? Um, so I would say spend uh, just a couple minutes going through uh, that electrolyte movement uh, as it relates to this cardiac, con uh, cardiac action potential chart. Um, you know, once you're kind of getting comfortable with all the rest of the ECG stuff, uh, circle back to this one. Um, I don't personally emphasize it too much for you guys, um, but I have heard some people that have said they've gotten a uh, phase one, you know, what's going on in the heart uh, in phase one of the cardiac action potential on registry, uh, just kind of down the road. So there are some questions out there uh, and it's all just related to what are the electrolytes at that moment in time. All right. Cool. Okay. Uh, so this actually, if you were following along with your own PowerPoints or had looked through them, uh, this just jumped a whole lot of slides uh, to get to this one. Um, it's just as I was going through and looking at stuff that we had already covered and just kind of maximizing the day with uh, a review of new material and getting us a little bit out of all that ECG stuff that we spent so much time in. Uh, this was one that uh, that I left in here uh, just because it's a, a concept. We don't use it all too often. Uh, or we do, but we don't actually call it or address it as that. Uh, so it's this idea of the J point, uh, which is the start of the ST segment and the end of the QRS complex. Uh, so in this case, it's very exaggerated, right? They're showing you uh, right there is the J point. As that kind of deviation from there's our QRS complex spike and then it's ST segment. Uh, so that's the point, uh, if you can see it on an ECG, that's the point that we would evaluate against saying the ST segment is elevated or depressed would be specifically that J point. Um, so if we had, and it's up there, right? We talk about the ST segment. Specifically, we're looking at exactly what that J point is doing. Now, sometimes it might become a little bit more difficult, right? Where it just kind of rolls together and we don't have a particularly clear uh, J point. That becomes a little bit more difficult. Sometimes, if you look really closely at it, you may see like a slight angled difference in which you could say okay there's actually 
uh, my J point for it. So sometimes when you get up, up close to it, you can see a slight, slight, slight deviation, and that would actually, again, that would be the J point. Um, so again, that's specifically when we're talking about the ST segment being elevated or depressed, uh, it's actually evaluated against specifically where is that J point. Um, kind of like uh, on our end tunnel, right? You know, we've got this whole end tidal waveform, but we're specifically evaluating that end tidal CO2 reading just on that last little spike right there. Um, so it's again, it's just the same little concept point that I wanted to hit for you guys is that uh, J point uh, evaluation. Um, so every once in a while, like I said, you'll see it on the exams and stuff like that. You know, be like J point and the ECG, like we never talked about that. Um, it's purely just the start of the ST segment. All right. All right. So this one uh, we've certainly uh, reviewed as well, the kind of ECG progression of ischemia through injury through infarction uh, and what starts to show up. Uh, so I definitely, uh, it's such an important one that I wanted to uh, just highlight again. Remember going from normal to ischemia, Right, and it's a progression, right? If we had a patient that was experiencing angina and it was progressing to unstable angina, progressing to a full-blown infarction process, if we did nothing for that patient other than hook them up to the 12 lead and just sit there and 12 lead and take that, run a 12 lead, take a little, like just kept running 12 leads, uh, we would see this progression uh, develop. Uh, so one of the first ones that shows up, remember, is those inverted T waves. Right? Inverted T waves is an early, you know, hypoxia ischemia process, is the inverted T waves, followed by our ST segment depression. Again, there's our J point, right? That's what we're actually evaluating. So S depression, uh, inverted T waves and ST depression, are the early hypoxia ischemia is that uh, cardiac tissue is is starting to hurt right uh, the the pain process of the chest pain is driven by the ischemic tissue uh, you know it's it's hurting right it wants that oxygen it needs that oxygen and so it's eliciting that pain response in the body uh, hopefully trying to get you know get some stuff going get that patient uh, breathing a little bit quicker trying to get some more oxygen in the system uh, so that ST uh, depression and that T wave inversion progresses. And then what we start to see, if there's our baseline, we start to see that ST segment start climbing, right? So it starts climbing actually when it's still considered injured. Some preceptors and medics that I know, they get real huffy about ST elevation is actually injury, not infarction. And I've always countered with that and said, well, why do we call it a ST segment elevation myocardial infarction and not a ST segment elevation myocardial injury? Um, it's a little bit semantics for me, but that process starts in injury and it continues, you know, down into the infarction territory. So we still say STEMI and the I in STEMI is still infarction. Um, just again, if anybody ever kind of, well, it's actually injury, right? They're, just trying to be a jerk. <laughs> it starts with injury and passes. Uh, and then it's going, right? That ST segment usually will stay down, uh, upside down for a while, right? keep going. Right? And that's where we're starting to get, remember that frowny face shape, right? That concave shape of the ST segment uh, keeps going. And then what also starts to happen is this Q wave, right? This Q wave starts getting bigger and bigger and bigger, right? and it's it's more uh, textbook official that the full true absolutely we've got a ton of dead tissue is with big uh, pathologic Q wave development, uh, and the kind of quick and easy way of looking at that Q wave is if you take the total height of your QRS complex and cut it into thirds, right? So one third, one third, one third. If your Q wave is greater 
then a third the height of your total QRS complex, then it's going to be uh, considered a pathologic Q wave. Thank you. Uh, it's going to be considered a pathologic Q wave and uh, can be a sign uh, of a full blown infarction. Um, we, you know, thankfully, you know, we usually get called when it's, you know, more just in the big ST elevation process, uh, just because this person, they're hurting, they're hurting, they're hurting. They call 911, we get there, that's what it looks like. And they're hurting, they're hurting, they're hurting. And it just is gonna continue down that process. Um, so I'd say just the likelihood of them waiting to call 911 till the true full-blown massive, we got this huge dead spot of, of cardiac muscle is a little bit less common, certainly possible, right? Some people just won't call 911 until they're you know borderline dead. Uh, and so they wait and wait and wait. So we could see it. Um, uh, so if you get there and right, and you see, you're like, hey, my ST segment's not elevated, and this person's sitting there. They look like they're miserable, just crushing chest pain, gray, difficulty breathing, diaphoretic, everything. And you run the 12 lead, and you're like, hey, my ST segment's good, so it must not be an MI, right? But then they have this massive 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 q wave they have a tremendous amount of dead tissue infarcted tissue in that cardiac muscle cell uh, or in that cardiac muscle tissue uh, that's actively still dying even though we don't have the st elevation is because we've progressed past that part right where the st segment actually returns to baseline but we have this huge q wave that has actually showed up so don't overlook that big q wave uh, being a potential uh, of the ECG change that you see in the absence of the ST segment, that's still telling us that we have a full-blown uh, MI happening. And so again, Q waves are only considered pathologic. They're only considered a noteworthy finding. If you split your total QRS complex into thirds, and that QRS complex is particularly uh, encompassing a total height of that QRS. Um, if you uh, have a patient that has uh, a stub toe and for whatever reason you decided you wanted to run a 12 lead and you see uh, on their 12 lead an ECG that looks like this and massive Q waves, you're like, hey, that's usually infarction sign, but they only have a stub toe. That's the only reason why I'm here today. Uh, what could be the, the case is that that can also be just old lingering effects that they had an MI in the past, right? So you see this on a, on a patient, ask them their past medical history and see if they tell you that they've had a heart attack in the past. And I would hazard a guess and say they will, or they'll tell you that. Um, they might not, right? They'll be like, no, I've never had a heart attack, right? And what could have happened is they had one of those, you know, what we call a silent MI, uh, that it never presented with the pain, it never presented with anything. Uh, and so they never went to the hospital, they've never been to a cardiologist, and they, and they never got evaluated. Uh, but you can look at it and say, hey, you definitely don't look like you're currently having a heart attack, but based on your ECG, like, it looks like you did at some point, and maybe they didn't even realize that they had, right? Those are those scary ones, right? They're not too common, but you know, those silent MIs are, are potentials for sure. Now, it doesn't always show up uh, and it doesn't always stay there for old MIs. Uh, so like my grandmother that uh, like 20 years ago, she coded pre-hospitally from an EMI, uh, and uh, she, she got return of circulation, got to the hospital and everything, and then, Six years after that, it was some time period after that, she had another heart attack and she had gone through the whole quadruple mass surgery and everything, and she's still alive to this day. Uh, I've seen her current 12 lead, and even with two MIs, one resulting in quadruple bypass, she doesn't have the big uh, pathologic Q wave development. Um, so, you know, that's, you know, just kind of an anecdotal story of mine, but I know for a fact it doesn't always stay there afterwards, uh, but sometimes it will. And so sometimes you may uh, you may see that it actually uh, 
continues and stays there. All right. Uh, this is another random one. Uh, it definitely shows up uh, in our environmental emergencies chapter later on, uh, but since it results in a change on the ECG, it comes up in this chapter too. Uh, in severe, severe hypothermia cases, uh, they'll give uh, what we call a J wave or an Osborne wave. Right? And what it looks like, it looks like a little P wave that just sticks outside the back of the QRS complex. Right? And all it is, if you ever saw that, uh, you know, usually it'll show up with some T wave inversion as well. Uh, have that, just that extra little positive bump back there. Uh, it's a J wave or Osborne wave. It's just a sign for whatever reason on the ECG, it shows up in severe hypothermia cases. Um, and with hypothermia is usually a tremendous amount of uh, bradycardia as well, right? As everything in the body just gets colder and colder and colder and colder, things start slowing down and slowing down and slowing down. Right? So heart rate starts slowing down. So they're usually bradycardic. And then we'll get this little uh, bump that'll show up back there as well. So J wave or an Osborne wave, uh, that's that's what that is. Um, we're not going to dive into you know other unique things that we do with uh, with hypothermia or anything like that. We'll save that for the environmental uh, chapter later on. All right, uh, so non-cardiac causes other ECG abnormalities. Uh, we know, obviously, the whole thing is electrolyte driven, right? So electro if electrolyte balances um, are out of whack, uh, different things are gonna start showing up on the monitor, right? So hyperkalemia, remember, is high potassium, right? It's high potassium in the bloodstream, right? So remember, that's where uh, all of our electrolytes are getting evaluated on is they do a blood draw and see just how much potassium is floating around in the bloodstream, right? How much calcium is floating around in the bloodstream? How much sodium is floating around in the bloodstream, right? Um, so potassium, right, normally we said is the main uh, inside the cell uh, electrolyte and sodium is the main outside the cell. So floating around in the bloodstream and everything. So if a particularly large amount of cal uh, potassium is floating in the bloodstream, it's pretty bad, right? Because it didn't all get leached out of the cells more than likely. Usually the cells still have plenty of potassium. There's just so much extra potassium that the bloodstream you know, also has uh, a tremendous amount in it. So hyperkalemia uh, is the one that most all of our medic students remember, right? Big giant peaked T waves, right? Big giant peaked T waves uh, is initial uh, hyperkalemia. And so hyperkalemia, you don't need to know the values, uh, but most you know lab work that you look at, it'll say like 3.5 to 5 is the normal potassium range for the bloodstream. And so as potassium keeps uh, you know venturing higher and higher and higher. The T waves will get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then as it keeps going, then your QRS complex will start widening out. So you get weird, you know, this is a big wide QRS complex. That's our T wave and P wave, right? That QRS complex will start widening and widening and widening till eventually the heart just has that potential to get kind of triggered and irritated by stimulus that the continuance of just that potassium, it'll widen and widen and widen, and eventually it'll kick over into like VTAC and VFib, right? Um, that's why potassium is usually in the lethal injection drug cocktail, uh, is because eventually, just with that widening out of the QRS complex, uh, eventually uh, the heart will just get irritated and it will just get kicked into VTAC for them. Um, so definitely something that we see uh, potentially. Uh, usually we see it on the peak T wave side, right? Earlier in the, the hyperkalemia process, 
Um, but I have seen it one time with a drastically wide uh, QRS complex like that. Um, any guesses or ideas on kind of what patient conditions or patient populations that we really will see some crazy funky ECGs and crazy funky electrolyte imbalances? Uh, who do we see those on? Dehydration, maybe. Diabetics, dehydration, pro athletes. So we definitely can. Um, usually not like critical electrolyte imbalance. Um, you know, you can, you can get those patients going into rhabdo and, and get hyperkalemia that way. Uh, but there's probably even a more common patient that we run on uh, that we'll see electrolytes being really, really screwed up potentially. Hi, Alice's patients. There it is. Who said that? Me. Awesome. Yeah, dialysis patients, right? Um, just because their the kidneys aren't functioning, so you're not getting the electrolyte uh, regulation properly by our kidney, uh, means yeah. some of them, and particularly potassium, will start building up and building up and building up and building up. Um, and that was that patient that I had seen the really crazy wide QRS complexes was a dialysis patient that had missed dialysis and missed dialysis and missed dialysis. Uh, and we took this patient into the hospital. They they were feeling just kind of, you know, generally cruddy, uh, but not, you know, crazy altered or anything like that. And I showed the ECG to the doctor and it was like immediate critical patient, like straight into like the code bay to try to do what they could to immediately try to get a whole lot of that extra potassium out of their bloodstream. Just like, because they knew on a moment's notice, even though that person was looking okay at the moment, it could be just that next thing that sends them into VTAC and we're working at code. Um, so it's definitely really critical uh, with the electrolytes, um, specifically with cardiac functioning, uh, more so than uh, a lot of other considerations. So potassium and calcium, we're particularly worried about cardiac functioning. Uh, if sodium is really imbalanced, uh, sodium is a big concern for us with nervous system functioning, right? So I always remember it with sodium, you know, just because it starts with an N, right? Neuro is what we're worried about. Right? Calcium right? starts with a C, we're worried about cardiac. Right? Potassium. Kalemia, cardiac, I guess. I don't know. I don't have a helpful one for that. But <laughs> calcium and potassium, uh, big for for cardiac functioning. Um, the, the other one uh, with the peak T waves, right? Because we kind of get in the habit sometimes of saying, you know, looking at an ECG and saying, hey, that T wave looks tall, right? Um, there's proper measurements. Right? And it depends on where we're seeing the peaked T waves, if we're looking at a 12 lead. Right? So if we split the 12 lead in half and we have our chest leads and our limb leads, right? uh, on the limb lead side of it, the peak T wave is if it's greater than five of those little boxes, right? Or one of the bigger boxes. Right? So specifically, and we have some 12 leads that'll come up in, in a couple slides that uh, if you're looking on the limb lead side of a 12 lead, it has to be taller than five little boxes. On the chest lead side, it has to be taller than 10 little boxes, right? So they have to be particularly tall on the chest lead side for it to actually kind of diagnostically fall into that peaked T wave uh, side of things. All right. Uh, so hypokalemia, and I'm just going to kind of go through some of the opposites. Uh, hyperkalemia, we generally remember. Uh, hypokalemia, uh, what results is uh, T waves that usually get a little bit flatter, right? And then potential that the U wave can show up. The U wave can sometimes show up in completely healthy people, just when they go, uh, just once they're particular bradycardic. 
uh, but it could be a low potassium problem. And usually that T wave is, you know, more substantially taller than our P wave. Uh, so with low potassium, that T wave just starts flattening out a little bit. Um, that's pretty much it for the potassium ones that we're going to talk about. Uh, calcium. Uh, if you have hypercalcemia, so high calcium levels, shortened QT interval, uh, and then the opposite, if you have low calcium, it's a prolonged QT interval. Uh, so if we go back to this, right? So QT interval, right? start of the QRS complex through to your T wave. Right? So if it was uh, high calcium, right? your T wave might be a lot closer, right? a shorter QT interval. If it was low calcium, uh, maybe that T wave is way over here, and we have a really long QT interval, right? Uh, so calcium uh, just starts moving our T wave, right? The T wave just starts moving uh, side to side. So if you're kind of trying to figure out a way to, to say, how the hell do I remember this, right? And say, okay, potassium will make my T wave uh, make my T wave get taller. Low potassium will make my T wave get smaller. High calcium will make my T wave closer. Low calcium will make that T wave further out. Right, so it's all just different ways that things are getting uh, moved. Uh, specifically, the T wave is getting moved at least initially. Then potassium also has that potential to start widening out your QRS complex. You know, other things will show up as well. Um, but initially, at least, you can say, okay, T wave gets bigger, T wave gets smaller, T wave gets closer, T wave gets further out. Um, and that can hopefully just help kind of simplify uh, stuff a little bit for you. All right. I'm going to do a couple more slides. We'll take a break here uh, in a minute. Um, cardiomyopathy, right? So pathos on the end of a word is in the presence of disease. Right? Cardio, we obviously have heart. And then myo is muscle, right? So heart muscle disease, generically, right, is cardiomyopathy. Um, so it's a very kind of umbrella term. They can use it to encompass a few different things. Um, one of them is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is our myocardium wall becomes very thick, right? Hypertrophy, right? Just like if we said, uh, uh, where else do we use hypertrophy? My mind's drawing a blank now, geez. Uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, right? And the left ventricle wall gets thicker. Um, you can say, you know, you have hypertrophic uh, organs and stuff like that, just the organs swell up or whatever the cause is. So hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the entire heart, right? The myocardium walls, the entire heart becomes a lot thicker, right? Which sounds maybe like a positive thing. Hey, it's a bigger muscle, it means it's stronger, which means our heart's going to be able to pump more. That's awesome. Uh, but the bigger and bigger and bigger that muscle gets, just the constant work it's doing, uh, it requires a lot more oxygen, which means it's going to be very sensitive to a dip in that oxygen level, right? So a bigger cardiac muscle is not a good thing, right? Too big, it, it really becomes very, very sensitive to uh, oxygen levels inside the body um, uh, to the point that I think it was, um, and I may have even said in your class a few weeks ago, uh, but if you're a basketball fan, I just happen to remember it when I was watching basketball regularly. And now we're not watching it at all, so there's that. Uh, but Channing Fry, uh, who used to play for the Suns, you know, years and years ago, uh, there was a season where he was out for pretty much the entire season because he had dilated cardiomyopathy. Right, his whole heart was massively enlarged, and it was literally like you can't run around, you certainly can't play a professional sport. We basically want you on bed rest and just very low stress on the body. Because that heart is so big, it's going to be so sensitive. If it has to work a little bit harder and it needs just that little bit more oxygen, you know, you risk coding, right? 
And sometimes you see that in, uh, you know, a professional athlete that just drops dead. And we find out after autopsy wise that they had just a massively enlarged heart and uh, they hadn't, you know, got their, you know, you know, physicals or annual checkups or whatever, and they didn't know about it. And somebody they're just running, you know, down the, the soccer field one day and drops, right? Uh, and so very big issue, right? It's not like the guys that get all swole and everything where, oh yeah, you know, bigger muscles are better, right? Not for the heart, right? It's too sensitive. Uh, so shortness of breath, chest pain, syncope, uh, and restrictive cardiomyopathy. So a, another type, right? So hypertrophic is one type, restrictive is another type. Uh, the walls of the ventricle actually get stiffer, uh, which means they're not going to have as good an ability to uh, pump when those walls are stiffer, right? So you're going to be restricting uh, the, the effectiveness of that cardiac muscle uh, pumping. Right, so we've got a question, uh, does myopathy lower stroke volume also? Uh, the muscle is displacing space inside the chambers. Uh, when the walls are thickening, usually they're thickening um, and kind of widening out. I don't believe that like the size of the ventricles are, are narrowing. I think the whole heart is more or less kind of enlarging. Uh, and, and so I don't believe you're losing stroke volume uh, by the size of the chambers getting smaller. I think if you just took a picture of the heart and just enlarged it, Right, that's kind of what you're looking at, but um, I'm not a hundred percent sure on the chamber size is actually getting smaller. So it's a question. That's a good question. All right, uh, Brugada syndrome. Uh, I left in here just because every once in a while you'll you'll get people like everybody in you know, paramedic has their topic, right? And you guys probably know, you know, if you're working somewhere, if you interact with a lot of medics, a lot of medics have their topic, right? And it's whatever it is that, that they either really remember from school, so they have a kind of higher than baseline level knowledge compared to, you know, other paramedics, or uh, it's just one that has been of interest to them more. So, like, I always like cardiology and anatomy and physiology. Those are always my topics. So trauma is their topic you know other people ob is their topic what everybody's got their topic and you'll run into some of those medics that cardiology is their topic and they like to just bring up just random crap to you for lack of a better term uh, and they'll be like oh hey yeah i think this one's brigada syndrome and like, what are you talking about like there's a boatload of syndromes that you can pick up on a 12 lead uh, which, you know, once we go beyond hypoxemia, injury, and infarction, right, then you can say, okay, here's the 12 lead that if it presents this pattern, it's the sign of a pulmonary embolism. If the 12 lead presents this pattern, uh, it can be a sign that they're having uh, hemorrhagic bleed in their head. Uh, if you have this pattern presenting, uh, you can actually get uh, identify that they have a, a disorder of the sodium channels in their cardiac muscle cells, right? So in those membranes, we have, you know, our calcium channels that allow for it, and we have the sodium potassium channels that allow the sodium to move out. Uh, we can identify if a very particular uh, pattern shows up on the 12 lead, say, oh, they've, they've got a disorder of that sodium channel. You're like, okay. Do I need to do anything about it? What What are we talking about right now? So I left this one in here. I never emphasize it with with uh, kind of initial education of paramedics, just because there's so much and this is so in depth that it's really uh, just it's really unnecessary to push to this level. Uh, but I wanted to leave it in here just so when you run into that medic. Uh, because you will, and Brugada syndrome is the one they'll bring up. They don't actually know any other ones. They'll bring up Brugada syndrome just because they like saying Brugada syndrome, I guess. Uh, it's a disorder involving the sodium channels. It's an incomplete branch that you pick up uh, on your chest leads. And an ST segment elevation that returns to baseline. 
uh, you know, in subsequent leads and then be one, two, sometimes three. Uh, so V1, ST elevation, ST elevation returns to baseline, right? So ST elevation, ST elevation, return to baseline. Right, so that progression of V1, V3 uh, is one characteristic. And then some are usually pretty good about complete right bundle branch. So if we're looking at the rabbit ears, right, it doesn't quite fit all the criteria because there goes back to completely great over there. Uh, that would be, uh, again, theoretically how you would identify the Brugada syndrome. Uh, so you can sound awesome and say, hey, I think my patient has a disorder of their sodium channel. And 99% of paramedics would be like, shut up. What are you talking about? Uh, and one person would be like, yeah, respect. I got you. You're recognizing the same stuff I am. <laughs> uh, so that's that's it for that one. Uh, the vast majority of time, I would uh, prefer that you look at this and say, hey, you know, kind of initially, I think I've got an elevation in V1 and V2, which uh, STL in, in V1 and V2 tells us what generally, if we're not talking about Brugada syndrome, what does ST elevation in V1 and V2 mean? Who's got it? Remember, what areas on the 12 lead are we looking at with V1 and V2? No. So right sided, uh, suggestive right sided is our 2, 3, and AVF, right? Inferior. Again, suggestive of potentially right-sided. Uh, cool, Travis, Michael, James, awesome. Yeah, V1 and V2 is septal. Remember V3 and V4 are anterior. And then V5, V6 are lateral, so the side of the left ventricle, right? When we set up the 12 lead normal, remember we're kind of zoning in on the left ventricle. Right? So we have the heart, right? We've got V1 and V2 looking at the septum. V, V3 and V4, the anterior wall of the left ventricle. Uh, V5 and V6 looking side of the left ventricle. Uh, the 2, 3, and AVF is looking at it from the bottom, uh, AVF, right? which is why we're thinking we're probably catching that right ventricle. And then the leftovers are 1 and AVL, which most of the time they'll say are high lateral, which is just higher up that left ventricle, 1 and AVL. So again, remember... Um, those are just kind of crucial ones. You got to remember uh, which areas of the heart are looking at it. Um, cool. How do you guys feel um, on 12 lead? And, uh, at least in terms, I'll say this, not in terms of Brugada syndrome and stuff like that. How do you feel about 12 leads in terms of which areas of the heart are looking at which uh, leads or which leads are looking at which areas and then uh, the ischemia through infarction process how do you guys feel with that aspect pretty good so okay. struggle with what it's looking at decent <laughs> yeah sums up a lot of people Meh. Good review if we have time. Good. Um, yeah, I will. Um, I'll figure out either on 
class time on some of these days uh, or potentially a whole other review session where we do nothing but 12 lead review. Um, I'll figure out something like that. And for those of you that do feel good about 12 leads, I'll even maybe push uh, further into some of the other stuff that we can glean on it. So maybe I'll do a little 12 lead class that'll just be kind of uh, basic 12 leads for the first half and then uh, advanced 12 leads for the, the second half of it. Um, if that sounds like a good idea for you guys, um, but I'll, I'll push further on some of that stuff. As I said, I can do just 12 leads all day long and ECG cardiology all day long, just because that's my topic. I like it. All right, so jumping back into it, other things uh, that come up is, uh, get you guys out of my way here. All right, so other things that come up uh, for us, uh, long QT syndrome is definitely one. Uh, there's a mathematical answer for it, and there's kind of the quick and easy visual. So mathematically, a QT interval exceeding 0.45 seconds. Uh, so you could figure out how many boxes that is, but again, QT uh, interval start of the Q wave through end of our T wave. Uh, is that QT interval. Uh, the quick visual way is if you went QRS complex to QRS complex, found your halfway point, and then saw that the T wave was beyond that halfway mark between it, is going to be uh, long uh, QT. Uh, Riley, quick question. Do we need to know the reciprocal leads for the exams? Um, understand the concept of what it is when we talk about reciprocal leads and reciprocal changes. So if we're saying we're having a, a MI in the lateral wall because we see it in uh, lead V4, V5 and V6 and we're seeing reciprocal changes in this other area with ST depression, right? So we see the ST elevation on one side and the ST depression on the other side of our 12 lead. Uh, understand kind of conceptually what reciprocal changes are. Um, that's where we're going to start with that. Um, later on, again, you just kind of want to push further into cardiology, then it's certainly better to understand which leads can actually be reciprocal leads to which other leads, but just understand kind of the general concept of reciprocal changes, um, not actually the specific reciprocal leads right now. All right, so, whoops, let me get back to it. All right, so long QT, uh, again, greater than uh, distance uh, between two QRS complex greater than 0.45 seconds. Uh, when we run a 12 lead uh, on most monitors, they print out a whole bunch of numbers on the top. Right? And it's where they'll also say, uh, acute MI, if the monitor thinks that there's an MI going on. But in those numbers is usually the QT interval. Uh, and sometimes you'll see like QTC for it. Uh, and they'll give it in milliseconds, right? So they'll say 450 milliseconds. That's the number that you look at to say, okay, this is actually my 0.45 second. Uh, that's a you know normal uh, QT interval. A lot of people will go a step further and just say greater than 500 milliseconds, which is going to be greater than 0 0.5 seconds is uh, kind of numerically considered a long QT. Um, so you can remember that greater than 500 if you're looking at those QT numbers go up on the top of lead. Um, so like I said, we'll get some more in here. We'll kind of highlight some of those numbers that you can look at. Um, the danger with long QT is uh, VTAC, right? And we're talking about, you know, that refractory period of our T wave. Right now we're getting an electrical signal of the SA node starting to fire. Right, so we're risking what we call 
that are on T phenomenon, which is we're risking potentially we could get a QRS complex, like if a PVC kicked out or something. Uh, if we get a big enough electrical impulse that hits on that 12 lead, you know, the next thing that would come is is VTAC and VFib, right? They would code on us. Um, so that's the risk as that QT segment gets longer and longer and longer, right? Remember, that's the heart's not beating, not beating, not beating. So maybe a PVC could kick out or something like that, or wouldn't it be PVC, right? Uh, so we risk, you know, an electrical impulse hitting that T wave and sending them into a lethal arrhythmia like VTAC. Um, so it's definitely one that uh, is a danger. Uh, and when we kind of pivot to our B round drug, drug quizzes and look at adverse effects and contraindications, we'll see this long QT syndrome come up uh, a little bit more often. Like Zofran is one that we're not supposed to give to somebody with long QT. Um, so there's a few medications that are particularly uh, ones that we uh, we don't want to do that. Um, so we'll keep an eye on that. So two ways, and you remember greater than 500 if you want milliseconds, or the textbook narrows it just a, a hair and says uh, 450 milliseconds or 0 0.45 seconds. Or the other one, just kind of the, the quick and dirty, again, was the... Uh, T wave was longer than half the distance between two QRS complexes is going to kind of mathematically push us into that territory as well. All right, so it can be the result of a genetic mutation of several genes, so it can be congenital, right? Long QT syndrome can run in families, right? Uh, administration of certain drugs, so like I said, some drugs, the kind of adverse effect that they have, or one of the adverse effects that they have is a being of that T interval, right? And the longer that T interval is, again, the more risk they are being kicked into, um, again, something like VTAC. Uh, other uh, conditions, so we said calcium, right? Hypercalcium, uh, calcemia, move the T wave closer to the QRS complex, hypocalcemia, move that T wave further away, right? So the further away that T wave is, the longer that QT is gonna be. Um, potentially it could show up with MIs, pericarditis, um, you, know, you know, definitely uh, some stuff. The most common ones, right? right? I mean, not, I would say maybe not most common, but uh, the most commonly talked about is congenital uh, long QT and adverse effects of medications and in turn contraindications right so if a medication causes long qt then if they already have long qt right then that would be a contraindication right because if we know the medication lengthens the qt even further if it's already long we don't want to lengthen it even even further right kind of like our medications that slow down heart rate like that's, but if their heart rate's already slow, we don't want to slow it down more, right? So if their QT is already long, we don't want to lengthen it out any more than that. All right, this is uh, one of those ones that I said are some of the weird other stuff that once you're great with 12 leads and you just want to push further and further, uh, you can potentially see uh, signs of an intracranial hemorrhage uh, showing up on the 12 lead. Um, and usually they'll, they'll call them cerebral T waves. Right? You can go back into ECGs made easy, and that's in there as well. Uh, but normally uh, they say that T waves are supposed to be slightly asymmetric. Right? They're not supposed to be perfectly, uh, you know, kind of mirrored images. They're supposed to be slightly kind of tilted, right? So it's not a direct, you know, symmetrical uh, visual. And intracranial hemorrhages, they're, the T waves show up uh, inverted first and foremost, and then pretty cleanly symmetrical. That's what they're talking about, is these T waves are nice and symmetric, right? Now, this is one of those ones where it's like, great, 
you know, we have this patient that might be altered or complaining of something. So we ran a 12 lead and we ran the 12 lead just initially with that mentality of seeing if they are having some sort of cardiac condition and MI that's causing their problem. All right. So we might do our quick uh, view of the 12 lead and say, I don't see any ST segment elevation, so I'm great. Maybe we see the T wave inversion. So we think, oh, maybe there's some cardiac ischemia. Maybe this is a cardiac thing. Uh, but more than likely, uh, the complaint hopefully is going to kind of tilt us towards that hemorrhagic stroke, right? Intracranial hemorrhage. Uh, you know, something in there might be telling us that it's a head bleed, uh, ideally. Uh, but if we're still, I mean, on the fence and you happen to remember uh, this pattern uh, where you see a, there's our distance, right? halfway between the two, see how our T wave starts venturing past that halfway mark, right? Has a potential to be that long, uh, prolonged QT, uh, and then these big upside down symmetric T waves, or cerebral T waves. Um, I tell you for a fact, cerebral T waves are not on the module exam or anything like that. Uh, it's just another one of those, if you just love 12 leads and you're getting a kick out of all this type of stuff, then you can just keep going, like I said, further and further with all sorts of different stuff. All right, so that's all the stuff that I pulled out from uh, the, the electrophysiology stuff. The rest of it's going to roll into just the different uh, disease. So there's a few different uh, terms that get used. Uh, cardiovascular disease, AJ says, leading global cause of death, those are CVD, if you see that. And that's the umbrella term. It encompasses angina, encompasses MIs. It's our CHFers, uh, you know, generally what happened is they had an MI in the past and now they have that heart failure, have enough uh, dead tissue on that heart that is not pumping properly. Uh, so it's very much an umbrella term. It can, can, it can, uh, it can mean any of the, the kind of subcategories for, for us. So disease of the coronary arteries, associated signs and symptoms. Uh, so we get into this uh, signs of angina, pectoris. <clears throat> That's our just general chest pain, AMIs. It's the, again, atherosclerosis, right, which is that uh, plaque buildup blocking our coronary arteries. Uh, the other one, is arteriosclerosis, right? Sclerosing, right? The sclerotic sclerosis. That's the narrowing of the blood vessel, right? So if we kind of cut the blood vessel and we were taking a look inside of it, uh, as that plaque is building up and building up and building up, right? And now the opening is a lot, this opening is a lot smaller than it used to be. That's the sclerosing, right? Um, so they use that same sclerosis term. They can say uh, aortic valve uh, sclerosis or stenosis. Sometimes they'll shift it and they'll say stenosis. That means that aortic valve in the heart isn't opening as well as it used to be. So it's uh, a narrowing of it. When it's caused by the tissue or whatever, they'll say it's sclerosing tissue, sclerotic tissue. So the sclerosis is a narrowing of the opening. And atherosclerosis is narrowing because of plaque. And arteriosclerosis is narrowing because the walls of the artery themselves are actually getting rigid and stiffening up. So both have the same effect which is less blood flow can work its way through a smaller pipe. It's just whether it's caused by plaque that's been building up or by the wall of the artery that's been stiffening up. All right. So again, there's that ACS term again, right? That's our chest pain patient. Uh, that's the acute coronary syndrome. That's the term, that's the protocol name that they have for our chest pain protocol. Right? We say chest pain protocol all the time. ACS is the more appropriate one. So remember ACS, that's what they're talking about. Uh, diminished flow through the coronary arteries uh, caused by a blood clot uh, because that plaque buildup has blood flow. 
then now we get those platelets that start sticking together. Right? So I would give our aspirin. Right? Those platelets start sticking together and start forming uh, a clot that starts building up and getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, another one, uh, coronary artery spasm, right? And so if they had some sort of toxin or something that triggered the coronary arteries to just spasm and massively vasoconstrict, then it's gonna have that same effect, just reducing the oxygenated blood flow from getting to that tissue. Um, and so we'll call that, sometimes you'll hear them say, vasospastic MIs, right? Since there's a vasospasm that's causing the MI, right? Has nothing to do with plaque buildup, nothing to do with a clot blocking it. Uh, it's just the blood vessels uh, constricted so much that it's cutting off the flow to the cardiac tissue. Uh, you can have cocaine induced vasospastic MIs, right? Cocaine is a potent, potent vasoconstrictor. Right? So some people will snort cocaine and it vasoconstricts in their coronary arteries and they have an MI that gets induced just by that cocaine in their system. All right, so again, this one's redundant. We've already talked about the atherosclerosis and the arteriosclerosis. Um, please just make sure you get those uh, terms comfortable. <clears throat> All right, uh, so risk factors for CHD, which is not a good uh, abbreviation anymore. Most often when you see CHD, it's congenital, congenital heart disease or congenital heart defect, right? So kids that are born with uh, where their aorta is attached is actually the vena cava. Where the vena cava is attached is actually the aorta, right? So those big blood vessels have uh, flip-flopped is how they were born, it's how their heart developed. So CHD almost always we're talking these congenital heart defects or congenital heart disease. Um, this uh, slide in this section of the book uh, still uses it. I'd encourage you not to use it, but their uh, term is coronary heart disease. Okay. Uh, more often than not, you see CAD, which is coronary artery disease. It's much more common nowadays that CAD, much less so that CHD for coronary heart disease. So uh, this slide has it and your book has it, but pretty much everywhere universally, you're going to see CAD for coronary artery disease. Um, and CHD, our congenital heart stuff, uh, when we get to our uh, OB neonates, pediatrics, patients with special challenges, uh, that's where the congenital heart stuff will come up. So this uh, section of the cardiovascular emergencies is not talking about congenital effects. It, obesity isn't, you know, responsible for us being born with the transposition of great vessels, uh, these congenital heart defects. So what they're talking about is just the coronary heart disease, uh, which is the class. I mean, we know obesity, lack of exercise, blood pressure, uh, poor diet, diabetes, confounding variables like smoking, family history of heart attacks and, and coronary artery disease, for sure. Uh, being a guy, you're just much more likely to uh, develop it, right? So we see that a lot in these medical chapters. You'll see it uh, in the demographic section of a lot of these slides, which mo not most, but a lot of the medical stuff, uh, it's most common in guys, right? Most common in males and females, uh, the pattern that presents, right? It's not anything else is just the, the patterns the demographics is the statistics are the, on the females most likely to die from it right whatever it is right so guys are more likely to get it women less likely to get it but more likely to die from it uh, so it's just a, a weird uh demographic thing that comes up a lot uh in these medical chapters that we're going to go through for the next month or two uh you'll see it time and time again 
uh, risk factor, male gender, right? The statistics, the statistics are guys are more likely to get it, women are more likely to die from it. Um, so for whatever reason, it's just a, a demographic statistic that comes up uh, quite often, actually. Uh, modifiable risk factors, right? Really the world that, that we should try to operate in. Right? If we have uh, a genetic predisposition, so we've got a family history of it, you can't change that, right? So you should look at just what variables are in your control, right? So, uh, you know, diet uh, and exercise and smoking, those are modifiable risk factors, right? We can change that, right? We can eat better, we can stop drinking, we can stop smoking, we can exercise more. Like those are variables that are in our control. Um, you know, so everybody's personal decision is try to control those variables as much as possible. There's enough stuff that's out of our control uh, or realistically out of our control that we can't uh, deal with. So we should focus on the variables that are in our control. Right? All right, so even here they shifted over to CAD. Like I said, CAD uh, just way more common uh, to see CAD as opposed to CHD. Uh, so angina, uh, we know it. Uh, the cardiac muscle, right, doesn't get enough oxygen, starts to cause that pain. Uh, without enough oxygen for the demand, it shifts over to anaerobic metabolism, whose you know more major byproduct is that lactic, lactic acid buildup. Uh, so less efficient at creating energy, right? If you go back to our anatomy and physiology stuff, in uh, aerobic metabolism, we make like 34 ATP molecules, energy molecules. In anaerobic metabolism, uh, we generate two ATP molecules, right? So aerobic, our main byproduct is CO2, which is very easy for us to get rid of in the body. We just breathe it out. In anaerobic, the byproduct is those lactic acids. Right? It's not easy to break down and get rid of in the body as just breathing, right? So it takes a lot more effort from the body. So much less efficient and harder to deal with byproducts than our aerobic metabolism, which is way more efficient at making energy and the byproduct is something, again, that's very easy for, uh, for us to get rid of. Uh, so one of the great questions, right, we're talking about our OPQ, our ST stuff, and we have our chest pain patient, and we ask him, well, what were you doing? And they're like, I was sitting on the couch watching TV, and my chest started hurting. Right? And you're like, okay, so you were doing pretty much nothing as an energy expenditure on the body, and your heart couldn't with the oxygen demand right or your body couldn't keep up with the oxygen demand that your heart needed and you started having chest pain that's really bad right it's the same as the people that say uh, their chest pain woke them up right? they were asleep arguably like the lowest stress possible time for us they were asleep and their heart wasn't getting enough oxygen um but that's really bad that's way pushing into uh, the infarction process is going to be starting, right? Versus the person that says, yeah, I was running three miles and right at the end of, of my three mile run, I started to get some chest pain. It's like, all right, that's at least slightly more understandable, right? You've been running for three miles, you, your body needed more oxygen, couldn't quite keep up with it, so you developed the chest pain. That makes sense, right? If you're like, I was sitting on the couch watching Jeopardy and my chest started hurting. That's very bad, right? It's just like the asthma patient that says they've been intubated before for their asthma. You're like, oh, okay. So none of what I'm going to do is going to work. Perfect. All right. Uh, so that's what that they're saying there. If it's occurring at rest, right? When we ask our OPQRST questions, if it's occurring at rest, it's way more severe uh, of a finding. Right? Both are bad, but this one's worse for sure. All right? Stable and unstable angina. Uh, we've definitely talked about before, but there's a pretty recurrent pattern, right? That's that patient that they know, like every time I walk up a flight of stairs, my chest starts hurting, I sit down for five minutes and it goes away. And tomorrow they walked up a flight of stairs, they, their chest started hurting, they sat down for five minutes and it went away. The next day 
They walked up flight, that flight of stairs, their chest started hurting, they sat down, five minutes, it went away, right? There's a pattern to it. They can expect it. They know, hey, by the end of, of mowing my lawn, my chest always hurts a little bit, so I sit down and it goes away. Uh, unstable angina, now we're starting to break that pattern, right? Unstable, we're breaking the pattern. I say, normally, I walk up a flight of stairs and my chest starts hurting. I sit down for five minutes and it goes away. Today, I walked up a flight of stairs, my chest started hurting. I sat down. It's been 45 minutes, my chest is still hurting, right? It's breaking the pattern. Usually it went away in five minutes. Now it's been 45 minutes and it's still hurting, right? That's telling the problem is getting worse, right? It's getting more serious. Uh, it's either uh, happening more often, it's more severe, or it's lasting longer, right? Uh, something is changing, it's getting worse, and it's telling you, you know, the big one's coming, right? If we don't do something serious, I get them to the cath lab, find out if they need stents or whatever it is, uh, they, they're going to kick over to MI territory one of these days for sure. Um, so all of our stable angina patients, then if they have the diagnosis, those are the patients they're walking around with their own nitro script. Uh, you know, maybe their pattern is they take one nitro, you know, and the pain goes away, right? So they know, yeah, I take one nitro, pain goes away. And today they've taken three nitro and they still have pain. Right? Maybe that's the pattern that's breaking. Usually it resolves uh, with nitro and today it didn't resolve with nitro. They still have the pain, right? That's one that uh, can also be the the piece that's telling us that their problem is getting worse. Uh, Prinz metal angina. Prinz metal angina is one of those vasospastic MIs, right? Or vasospastic uh, chest pain. But it's still the root cause, which is the low oxygen to the cardiac muscle tissue. Uh, this again, it's it's the constriction of the blood vessels. Uh, once they identify that that's what's actually causing their chest, uh, the diagnosis might be that Prinz metal angina um, causes chest pain at rest. Just again, for whatever reason, those blood vessels they need to, to uh, constrict up, and now it's reducing the flow to the heart, so they're having that chest pain. Uh, at risk of you know dysrhythmia, progressing to the MI. Uh, if their heart just, depending on what rhythm they go into, their blood pressure starts dropping, so they have a syncable episode, uh, maybe they code entirely because of it, right? So remember, if it vasoconstricts enough and their heart can't get enough oxygen, right, it's only a handful of minutes before that cardiac tissue will start getting really irritated and start venturing into the injury and infarction territory. So definitely one uh, that comes up. It's Prinz metal angina. So angina, stable angina, un, uh, angina, the stable and unstable angina, Prinz metal angina is the vasospasm. Then there's one more angina to throw in here. Uh, it'll come up in a handful of chapters. Uh, it comes up in the, uh, I believe the head, eyes, ears, nose, throat chapter. It's called angina has nothing to do with chest pain, but they use that angina term. It's a uh, uh, like a infection type thing. It's really annoying that they use the angina term because there's only one other time that we've used it, which is talking about our chest pain. Uh, but this Ludwig angina is a, is a dental pain uh, in your teeth. And so it's a weird one. I don't know why. I've never actually looked up why they actually call it, give it that angina classifier, but it doesn't, it's not chest pain at all, but that's the one other time that you'll see angina. So uh, that'll be, like I said, it's chapter 22 or something like that. It's a head, eyes, ears, nose, throat chapter. It's a very short chapter uh, that has just random bits of stuff uh, that doesn't apply too much to kind of critical emergent situations. Uh, but that Ludwig angina will come up in that one. All right. So AMIs, uh, we know a lot. We talked a lot about, so we move through it pretty quick. 
but if we don't get enough blood flow and enough oxygen back to that tissue, we know it's going to start dying. Uh, the location and size depends on which artery is blocked and where. Right? So when we talked about uh, the coronary artery wraps around the left side and then it's the left anterior descending coronary artery that goes down the right the left ventricle and then we have our right coronary artery that goes down and perfuses a right ventricle remember that's the same one that that blood vessel also goes up and perfuses the atria and the sa node which is why those right-sided ones remember are going to be low heart rate from yesterday and low blood pressure on our right-sided and left-sided high heart rate and higher blood pressure, again, at least initially. Eventually they're gonna to progress towards coding and their blood pressure will drop. Uh, so good. Uh, so a few uh, subcategories, uh, they say a subendovial myocardial infarction, only the inner layer of muscle is affected. Uh, so if we cut uh, and we looked at the wall of the heart, and this is the outside and the inside. Now we have our endocardium. Our myocardium is that big, thick muscle layer. And then the outer layer is our epicardium, right? So subendocardial is saying the infection is happening on that endocardial layer, right? Just that inner lining layer is where the infarction is occurring. Uh, transmural is across the wall or through the wall is that MI which starts to happen inside the myocardium right a myocardial infarction right it starts in that myocardium it starts in the big thick muscle mass which is what needs the most oxygen so it keeps developing it keeps getting spreading it keeps spreading until eventually that infarction is getting your epicardium and your endocardium, it's working its way all the way across uh, the wall of that ventricle, right? Uh, so transmural, again, is just the, the severity of that infarction has progressed through the entire wall of the tissue. Right. Alyssa, on the chat bar, said angina also refers to disorders where there's an intense localized pain. So the only time we ever talk about intense localized pain usually for us is the chest pain MI process. But if it was intense localized pain in your tooth, that would be that Ludwig angina. So thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, so the rest of the MI process, again, depending on where in that artery the blockage is, is gonna dictate just how severe the, the issues become. So if that plaque buildup blockage occurs down here in that left anterior descending, and that blood vessel is responsible for perfusing that tissue, <clears throat> then that tissue is gonna be what starts to infarct, right? Just the tissue that gets perfused by the blood vessel below that blockage. Right? If the blockage happens up here, and this whole blood vessel perfuses all of this territory, now we're risking the infarction covering out that entire space. Right? So it really uh, becomes the higher up the blood vessel, right? the more tissue gets blocked. Right? The lower down, the less tissue, higher up, the more tissue. Right? Uh, so that's all I'm saying by the size and location of that blockage. So those high up left coronary artery blockage, uh, sometimes you'll hear people say it was a widow maker uh, am I uh, widow maker There's supposed to be a W in there widow maker am I uh, just because if we cut off circulation to the entire left ventricle and that left ventricle pumps to generate our heartbeat so if we cut off circulation to the entire left ventricle that left ventricle is going to fail real fast which means we are, we're working a code because that heart's not able to pump that left ventricle is not pumping at all anymore Uh, so infarcted tissue is surrounded by a ring of ischemic tissue. Right? So if we have our heart and we say, hey, this spot, based on where the blockage in that coronary artery happened, this spot is infarcted. Right? Right? It's dead. 
right? Nothing we are going to do, no amount of aspirin, no amount of nitro, no amount of cath lab work, nothing in the world is going to uh, generate life again in dead tissue, right? It's dead. It's going to be there. Nothing's going to change that, right? We're not playing Frankenstein where we get to restore life to dead tissue, right? That tissue is dead. It's not coming back. Uh, surrounding that dead tissue is ischemic and injured tissue, right? And ischemic and injured tissue is still alive, right? So we can still save all of this tissue. If we do nothing, that infarction is just going to get bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So all of our aspirin or oxygen, uh, aspirin, and nitro is trying to reperfuse the blood flow to the uh, ischemic area to try to save all of that ischemic injured tissue and to limit the dead tissue to just what's already dead, right? So our treatment is purely just trying to save the ischemic injured tissue that's still alive, right? Uh, once it's dead, though, it's dead. So everything that we're trying to do is saving just that ischemic tissue. And as that infarction gets bigger, we generally get more ischemic tissue and more ischemic tissue, just depending on where in that blood vessel that blockage is at. All right, so assessment, obviously run our 12 lead, right? HA is big uh, and it gets emphasized in our ACLS stuff. Is big on early 12 leads, right? Early 12 lead. The earlier we get the 12 lead, the more likely we are to know if an MI is actually what we're dealing with, right? One of the things that sometimes happens is if we get there, <coughs> excuse me, if we get there and we have this chest pain patient and before we can do anything, they code. Right? Or maybe we get there already, we don't have that history. Uh, we might suspect that it was a STEMI, but we don't know. Right? So by getting a 12 lead really early, uh, which on those chest pain patients, right, when we have the four or five or six providers on scene, somebody gets that patient on a 12 lead like right away, just because we want to know right away if we're dealing with a STEMI. And then it also is going to come into play that if we're uh, dealing with this patient and they code, and we got a 12 lead, so we knew they were having a STEMI, we're gonna tell the hospital we're working a code and we got a 12 lead before they coded and they're having a STEMI. <clears throat> that's gonna tell them obviously, uh, we're still gonna work on getting uh, return of spontaneous circulation, but we know the cause was a blockage in that coronary artery. So not only do we just have to try to get a pulse back in the first place, we also have to deal with that blockage uh, in the coronary artery. So early 12 leads uh, for sure. Uh, the rest of our OPQRST question, uh, you know, depending on how that patient is looking and that STEMI progression, right? And, you know, maybe we don't have the pads on the patient yet, but we we have them all ready to go, right? Got our drug box out, got the the pads out. We're we're waiting and hoping that we're not going to have this patient code on us. Uh, so we're doing our again our aspirin nitro uh, protocol trying to get them safely and calmly to the hospital. Uh, but we're kind of mentally preparing for the possibility that we're going to be working a code. All right, chest pain is the most common uh, symptom. Uh, this first bullet point is called Levine's sign. Right? That's when the patient's talking to you and you ask them to describe it. They're like, it's just such a just crushing chest pain and they clench their fists, right? It's a weird like subconscious thing that they don't even realize that they're doing, but they start doing that. Uh, it's a very, it's highly, highly correlated that they're, uh, that they are in fact actually having that MI. That's called Levine sign. Again, they just, in their description of it, without even realizing it, they say, ah, it's just, it's just, it's just killing me. It's the, it's the pressure, the pain, and they're sitting there, they're squeezing their fist, right? Um, so again, Levine signs, very weird one, but highly correlated, again, uh, that they're actually having an MI. Uh, the radiating pain uh, can occur a lot of places, right? We'll talk about jaw 
uh, or down, you know, their left arm uh, potentially is one that you'll get. It can radiate to their upper back, uh, epigastrium, fingers, neck, right? Uh, there's a lot of, you know, nerve pathways and a lot of uh, places that they could describe uh, that they say that the pain, uh, you know, they, they're feeling, you know, it also in their jaw or their neck or their back. Um, again, not always the case. It doesn't always have to be there. That's uh, just some of the more uh, common ones. Especially with the epigastric issue, some people just say it's indigestion, and they're a little bit nauseous, or some of the other common symptoms that they may uh, complain about. Um, not influenced by body movements is another one that can help you with it. Uh, it's usually not, right? So if you tell the patient, like, or if you ask the patient, does anything make it better or worse? They're like, yeah, I take a deep breath, the pain gets worse, right? Now, it's usually not going to be the case with somebody having an MI. Uh, usually if they, you know, sit up and move or if they take a breath and they expand their chest cage out, uh, it doesn't usually make that pain worse or better. So if they say their pain moves with something like that, you know, it may be pericarditis, it may be another serious issue like pericarditis or something, but it's maybe a little bit less likely that it's an MI. It still could be the case, right? There's always people that that has happened to, uh, but just kind of playing the statistics, uh, if body movement or something manipulates the pain, uh, we start to think that it's not actually an MI that's happening. Uh, not every patient has uh, chest discomfort, right? Those are those silent MIs that we talked about earlier. Um, and again, that's that's one of them. Sometimes uh, chest discomfort would be a better way. We just fall in the habit all the time of saying chest pain, chest pain, chest pain, right? Some people get out of them and they say, I don't have pain, right? But they say the pressure, right? So sometimes you ask, you know, hey, you know, what's going on? Do you have any pain? They say, nope, right? Some maybe chest discomfort is a better uh, a better way to phrase it or any pressure or discomfort, uh, you know, a little bit. So if they say pressure, we can still uh, put us into our, you know, chest pain protocol, MI territory, or if they ch say chest discomfort, uh, that all still kind of fits the bill, right? We don't need them to say that magic word of chest pain for us to go into our, our protocol that way. Uh, it could be some of the other stuff, or it could be some of our uh, some of our atypical presentations, right? Some of the other, you know, things like you know, they complain of epigastric pain. You know, we run a 12 lead and we see massive ST elevation, right? Uh, you know, they're complaining of nausea and vomiting, right? They're just being lightheaded, right? Some of the other stuff uh, that comes with it as well. Um, nausea, vomiting, dyspnea, diaphoresis, uh, and chest pain uh, or palpitations are kind of the big classic ones and that radiating pain. Uh, so the classic, uh, again, chest pain radiating my left arm, uh, the kind of, you know, if we could all just sit back and say, okay, what's my MI patient look like? If I could picture him in my head, I said chest pain that radiates down my left arm. That's going to be like a 60 year old white guy. Right, just the kind of classic stereotypical one. But not everybody presents that way. So you just gotta remember that in your assessment and just think about uh, why, uh, what's going on with my patient and what might be uh, yeah, the issue. So women, uh, maybe they complain of discomfort in the back, shoulder or neck that comes and goes, or their primary complaint is shortness of breath or nausea, vomiting, and they don't have that substernal crushing chest pain that radiates, you know, to their arm or to their jaw or neck or anything like that. Um, so maybe we lose out kind of the main one of that chest pain or discomfort, but we get shortness of breath and nauseous. Right? So say, okay, you know, a patient said, well, let's go ahead and run a 12 lead. Right? And so I told you, if you go to like the red book and look at that 12 lead protocol, like if that shortness of breath, run a 12 lead. If they have weakness, run a 12 lead. Nausea and vomiting, run a 12 lead, right? Just because you might pick up on that MI one day for somebody that doesn't give you a complaint of any chest pain or discomfort whatsoever, right? So if I get in the habit of you know running those 12 leads and saying, well, it's at least possible that somebody could be presenting just with weakness and they're actually having a MI, right? 
And so in the grand scheme of it, it's, you know, it's uh, it maybe a bit personally invasive just by, you know, needing to put the stickers on the patient's chest. Uh, but otherwise, it's a non-invasive procedure. All it takes is a couple stickers in about a minute of time uh, to uh, evaluate that patient and see if we uh, are having a cardiac event or not having a cardiac event. So very uh, low invasion and very low time commitment to potentially find one day that somebody's having a big full-blown MI. And I'd rather you run a bunch of 12 leads and not find an MI as opposed to not finding or not running a 12 lead and then missing an MI. That would be worse. Uh, older adults uh, and diabetic patients are other ones that uh, will present with some of the, you know, maybe their chief complaint is just generalized weakness, right? Maybe they had a syncopal episode. Maybe they're a little sluggish, right? We check a blood sugar and say, hey, blood sugar is 110. So I've got my diabetic patient that looked like a diabetic patient, but then I ruled out it's not sugar, right? All right, you know what? Let's run a 12 lead, take a look, find out what's going on, right? So don't, you know, we don't jump at it. We're still going to run our assessment. We figured out in this case, hey, we ruled out that the sugar is not the issue for this patient. Uh, so let's, uh, let's run a 12 lead and find out what's going on. All right, take note of all of our normal stuff, uh, left-sided or left ventricular failure or right ventricular failure, we talked about a little bit yesterday. On the left side, it backs up into the lungs. So we get wheezes or crackles, uh, other name for crackles or rails. Uh, on the right side, it backs up into the body, into the vena cava. So we see the, uh, the jugular vein distension or pedal edema if they're upright or sacral edema if they're bedridden, right? So just gravity dependent edema. Uh, management, uh, as we know, uh, the, the obvious uh, oxygen, aspirin, nitro, and then morphine, or a lot of places their protocols have shifted to uh, fentanyl for the narcotic. Uh, both of those have just a little bit longer lasting vasodilation than nitro. So there are also vasodilators that are going to reduce our preload and afterload, just make a, a little bit less workload, a little bit less oxygen demand on the heart. Uh, they're also going to help with pain. They're also going to help with just uh, keeping the patient emotionally at rest, right? Just by that slight sedative euphoria narcotic effect that's beneficial uh, because any stress anxiety that this patient has is just going to make their heart pump faster, right? What they're going to start getting concerned, their body's going to go into that fight or flight response, their blood vessels are going to constrict, their heart rate's going to increase, and now that sick heart is being pumping faster uh, and harder uh, because of the vasoconstriction of that increased afterload. So now it's making that heart work harder and harder and harder, which means the heart needs more oxygen uh, just to deal with the increased uh, workload that we're having. Uh, and the source of their entire issue is we already don't have enough oxygen getting to the heart, and now the heart needs even more. So we have even greater of a deficit, which just means that the heart is going to be going through that ischemia injury infarction process. It's just going to be working through that faster. Right? So the more we can do to just keep our patient calm and chill and talk to the patient in a nice calm manner, get them to the hospital as quickly but safely and gently as possible uh, is going to go a long way just to help uh, manage some of that stress reaction in their body. And so keeping them nice and calm, uh, maybe having that courtesy notification to the hospital saying we're bringing you a STEMI, uh, you know, saying that with, you know, not in earshot of the patient potentially, uh, just to not have that patient hear that they're having a heart attack and that, you know, gets them more agitated and anxious uh, even more so than they already are. Uh, so this one we said already, obviously having them on the monitor, having our drug box ready to go, um, you know, putting the pads on somebody is probably gonna freak them out a little bit more. Uh, so if they're still alert and with you, uh, I might have the pads ready to go, 
but maybe not on the patient yet. And then be watching them if they ever, you know, dip or go altered or whatever, then bam, we can slap on those pads right away, evaluate them and defibrillate if necessary. Or maybe we catch them when their body first goes into VTAC with a pulse and uh, we can cardiovert them right there on the spot. All right, Mona is the old one. Uh, everybody used to say, oh yeah, remember Mona for your chest pain. I never understood it because it's completely out of order, right? You know, oxygen, aspirin, nitro, morphine is the order that we go through, but people like to say, oh yeah, Mona, right? But we don't do Mona. We do uh, aonum, um, <laughs> so. And then for most places, like I said, most places now, uh, it's fentanyl, right? not a narcotic. All right. So uh, oxygen administration, uh, they say, and, and AHA definitely emphasizes it, is we're shooting for 94 to 99% on our SpO2. Uh, we don't want to blast them up to 100% SpO2 because too much oxygen uh, causes vasoconstriction, right? So the more oxygen we have, the more vasoconstriction we're gonna have in their system. So if we're just continuing to blast them and blast them and blast them with high flow O2, then we're eventually going to uh, start causing some vasoconstriction in their body. Right? And if we think about it as causing more vasoconstriction in uh, the coronary arteries, then we're just reducing more blood flow, more oxygen to that tissue. Uh, so we don't wanna do that. So 94 to 99% is really what we should be looking at for our SpO2 uh, for patients uh, like our ACS chest pain patients. Uh, 12 leads, again, like we said, early, right? Do it within 10 minutes. So early 12 leads and then often, right? Uh, you know, frequently this part kind of falls off, right? One 12 lead is good, two is better, right? So just like one set of vitals is great, two is better, right? We wanna see the trending, right? So running subsequent 12 leads, if we have a few extra minutes on the way to the hospital, cycle another 12 lead, right? Did that ST, uh, ST elevation get worse, right? Was here, did that ST elevation get worse? It's telling us their MI is getting worse, right? Or we're getting, uh, more of a development of those Q waves showing up, right? or as we start getting more uh, oxygen on board, we got the aspirin on board, we're getting the nitro, did that ST elevation actually uh, get lower? Right? So we wanna know which way is our patient heading? Is their problem getting worse, is their problem getting better, problem not changing, which is also noteworthy. Uh, so running subsequent 12 leads is always a good idea. Uh, ultimately, with a lot of these, um, 12 lead is great. It's a diagnostic tool. It helps us recognize uh, that ST segment elevation. Uh, but if it's not there, right, they could still be having an MI. We said it's the non STEMI. We don't get that ST uh, elevation, uh, but they're in fact still having an MI. That's what we say. If the patient looks like an MI patient, they're sitting there, they're, you know, chest pain crushing, they're diaphoretic, they're sweating, they're gray, everything looks terrible, and then they don't have ST elevation, we're still going to be treating the chest pain, right? So we'll say treat our patient, not the monitor. Monitor can help support it, but if they look like a chest pain patient, treat the chest pain, right? We'll still uh, run down our aspirin and nitro, uh, even without the signs of a 12 lead, uh, or without the signs of a STEMI on the 12 lead. Uh, because they could still be having that infarction process. It's just not manifesting with the electrical changes. All right, so here's this one. This is going to be uh, a good opportunity for me to not talk for a second. And I'll just let you guys kind of jump into the chat bar and, and talk about some of the stuff that you see, uh, what you think it could be uh, indicative of, what we would call it. Um, the 
12 lead part is obviously everything above that. Uh, this is just a running, you know, continuous lead to rhythm strip. Uh, so we could do the rhythm identification off of this lead and the 12 lead interpretation off of this stuff up here. So we see a few ST elevation, two, three, and AVF, ST depression, possible right sided, inferior. Uh, so, rhythm identification, sinus rhythm, for sure, it's definitely sinus, right? Sinus with ST elevation uh, in that running uh, continuously two strip, absolutely. Cool. So the uh, sequence that I like to do, uh, the very first thing I look at is AVR. Right? If you're looking at, you know, hey, what do I, you know, where do I start? Right? Where do I start? So I always start with AVR, uh, and AVR should, uh, as long as the rhythm is sinus, should all be upside down. Right? Upside down P wave a mostly if not entirely upside down QRS complex and an upside down T wave, right? That uh, is not used to really, they don't use it to say it's looking at a particular area of the heart. Uh, that one we use to just kind of make sure everything is set up properly, right? So all the stickers and everything are in the right places. So if everything in AVR is upside down, right? Upside down P wave, QRS and T wave, then that's good, that's correct, right? It doesn't mean that this is, it's not junctional right here, right? Everything, right, if we're looking at the leads, like lead two that we normally look at, right? Everything is upright, positive P waves for sinus rhythm like normal. So AVR is all supposed to be negatively deflected. Uh, and then I usually go to the two, three, and AVF next, right? And if we're looking at our baseline, we have ST, right? There's our uh, J point that we talked about. There's our J point. There's our J point that we're evaluating. So I've got ST elevation and I've got ST elevation. So I've got ST elevation and two, three, and AVF which is inferior and makes us suspicious of right-sided. Uh, what uh, is a way that we can confirm uh, a right-sided MI? Right? So we suspect it based off of ST elevation in 2, 3, and AVF. Uh, how can we uh, potentially confirm ST elevation? So we can move all leads to the other side, right? So we have V1, V2, 3, 4, 5, 6. We could do V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And <laughs> just move V4. And then move an entire uh, 12 lead, uh, or run another entire 12 lead. Then remember, you got to write on the 12 lead that it's right-sided because the computer doesn't know you move the stickers around. So you could do V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Um, a lot of people, and you guys are chiming in here, you can just move uh, the V4 electrode over to the other side, run another 12 lead, and then what you can do is just write V4R, write an R right next to it on the monitor. Uh, uh, on the right side one, then you look at it, and you have a lot of elevation. 
confirm right sided. Right? So you can definitely do that. Um, there's another one that uh, Omar, uh, the flight medic, he just taught me that a couple weeks ago. Uh, he was doing this uh, online cardiology with this physician. And the doctor said, you don't need to actually flip it. Uh, he said, if we think about lead two, looking up at the heart that way, and lead three, looking up at the heart that way, if lead three way more so looks at the right side than even the lead two part uh, does. But we say two, three, and AVF, right? and AVF are all looking at the inferior wall. Two looks at it much more from the left side. Three looks at it much more from the right side. So if the ST elevation in lead three is higher than the ST elevation in lead two, uh, according to that doctor, at least he says it's right-sided, right? just because the nature of that lead three looks even more uh, at the right side than lead two does. Uh, and it makes perfect sense for me, uh, just thinking about the angles that the different leads are, uh, are looking at it. Uh, and I was blown away by that. So a few different ways. You can move all V1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. You can move V4 uh, over, or you can just look at the level of ST elevation on lead two compare it to the SD elevation on lead three. And if it's higher on lead three, it's much more likely that it's right-sided as well. So I thought that was really cool. All right, so somebody else said, uh, if you look at lead one, we have and lead AVF, or sorry, AVL, which are uh, contiguous leads. We have ST depression, right? ST depression in are high lateral leads. Uh, B1, say maybe a, a hair of ST elevation, uh, but at least on mine, I don't see any ST elevation on lead V2. Uh, so if I have it on V1 but not V2, is that indicative of anything? Can I use that diagnostically? Should I address it? Uh, in my identification or interpretation of the 12 lead, uh, if I just see it in V1, should I identify it? No, so somebody want to chime in with why, uh, why not? I forget the exact name for like uh, adjacent leads, but don't you need the findings in at least two leads that look at the same area of the heart to confirm anything. Yeah. So like leads two and three or leads feed one and two or, you know, five and six or, you know, six and lead one, something like that. Like you need two leads looking at the same area to confirm anything. Absolutely. Yeah. So we use that where it's contiguous, right? Two or more contiguous leads, which are two leads that are looking at the same area of the heart. So one and AVL are both looking at high lateral. So those are contiguous. So I have ST depression and ST depression. That's noteworthy. I've got it in two contiguous leads. Uh, this elevation in two, three and AVF, those are all contiguous because they all look at the same area of the heart. So having ST elevation, in this case, I've got it in all three, but two or more contiguous leads means I can call it something. V1 uh, on the chest leads, they're contiguous because they look at the same area of the heart, right? septal for V1 and V2. Uh, they're also numerically contiguous only on the chest lead side, so the V1 through V6. So even though V2 looks at septal and V3 looks at anterior, V2 and 3 are also contiguous uh, just because numerically they're in order uh, again, on these chest lead sides. So V1 has some ST elevation, but V2 does not. Uh, and V1 is only contiguous with V2, which means I'm not going to say a single thing about that ST elevation. 
Now, it could be the start of it, right? Subsequent 12 leads, maybe I see some SD elevation showing up in V2, and then that would be uh, a finding because now I've got it in contiguous leads. So V2 does not, uh, V3, say some ST elevation, uh, V4, and you know, close maybe, maybe not quite. V5, no, V6, probably no for looking at the actual J point there. Right? So what we have in this case is an inferior MI, potentially right-sided, right? with high lateral ischemia, right? So the infarction part is the most important part, so we always want to address that part first. Uh, but then we also still want to address the other things that we found too. So in this case, the inferior is uh, experiencing that infarction, right? These two, three, and ABF leads are experiencing the infarction. Uh, and I'm getting some ischemia showing up in these high lateral leads as well. So I've got a sinus rhythm at its core, right? And if I got a sinus down here, and then on the 12 lead again, an inferior MI with high lateral ischemia. All right, so treatment uh, at the hospital. We'll take a break here in a little bit too. I'll probably do lunch here in a little bit. Uh, treatment at the hospital in the cath lab is PCI or percutaneous uh, coronary intervention. Uh, that's things like uh, going in and putting stents, right? That little just mesh frame that they put into the blood vessels just to kind of try to open up those blood vessels and keep them open. So they put in a little mesh uh, kind of lattice uh, structure uh, just to keep everything open to allow blood to move through. And then the other aspect of it is our fibrinolytic or our clot buster drugs, right? Uh, lysis or lytic is destroying or breaking down. The fibrin, which forms kind of the mesh uh, base of our clots. Uh, I talked about this one yesterday, some of the various uh, times that get documented from us interacting the patient to the cath lab, right? To put a, the mesh uh, for the stents or over the balloons. So when they put the balloon uh, on the end of the wire into the coronary artery that they want to open up, then it inflates the balloon which opens up the mesh of that stent, and then they retract the balloon and the wire, and that mesh the stent stays inflated. So that's why you see that balloon time. Uh, door to balloon, right, from the time they get into the hospital to the cath lab, or door to fibrinolytics uh, is usually that door to needle time. Uh, we know our nitro dosage and contraindications pretty well. Uh, again, these patients, it always goes back to uh, time as tissue, time as muscle. So not as soon as we recognize it, right? Getting them calmly, right? remember calmly getting them to the hospital uh, as quickly as possible. We don't want to mess around on scene. Everything right now we're doing is just managing, uh, trying to stop the problem from getting worse. Uh, we still need that cath lab to go in there to actually try to deal with their issue. Transport patient, uh, whatever position of comfort works for them. Uh, and then keep an eye out. Not only are we dealing with the MI process, we also got to keep an eye on that monitor because if that heart gets irritated enough, right, maybe they go into VTAC or something. And now we've got to go into our TACI ACLS algorithm uh, to deal with the VTAC. Right? All right. Uh, refusals for these patients are high risk. You should do everything in your power to talk them into the hospital. Uh, call med control and say, hey, this person still wants to refuse. What should we do? Right. So just keeping them uh, really, uh, really, really encouraged to go to the hospital and right? get family to guilt them into them. Try to do that. All right. That's a great stopping point there. 
uh, just for our heart failure, which is where we'll pick up the rest of it. Uh, so I have about 1130 right now. It's not worth it to take a break and then come back for a little bit. Uh, so 1130 for lunch, let's be back at 1230. I'll reduce some ACLS scenarios and we're going to do some, uh, we're going to do some, the rest of this chapter as well. Um, MIs being the most kind of important critical thing that we could find uh, is why it's more emphasized here. Heart failure uh, gets emphasized quite a bit. And then the rest of them, like pericarditis is like one slide. Uh, so the rest of it kind of trickles off uh, just with being less common uh, for us to actually see and, and no, you know, less critical than actually having an infarction. All right, so the, we spent a little bit of time here uh, on the heart failure section. <laughs> you took a nap, it sounds nice. <laughs> Uh, the uh, heart failure section will spend a little bit of time, uh, but then some of the rest of it, it starts moving through a little bit quicker. Um, just like, you know, pericarditis has like two slides. So it's just, it, it'll pick up a, a little bit. We have about 80 slides left in this. Uh, so it'll probably take us up to uh, our next break, unless I get particularly long-winded. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, Andrea will jump on and she'll do some more of those uh, ACLS scenarios and kind of talking through some actual ones and get you guys uh, kind of thinking about your treatment and interventions and everything. So we'll do that uh, for a little while uh, and then uh, that'll wrap up uh, the rest of the day uh, just doing those ACLS scenarios. Cool. All right. <clears throat> All right, so heart failure uh, is really the continuance. Uh, like I said, a good bit uh, of the time, the way it starts, obviously somebody has, uh, you know, some sort of MI process that's happening. Uh, you know, we get that MI to stop in terms of just the continued uh, death of tissue. Uh, but now what happens is uh, they have that kind of lingering heart failure symptoms of just uh, the heart not being able to mechanically uh, pump as well. Uh, sorry, let me zoom my sharing here. I'm on the wrong screen. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. There we go. <clears throat> All right, so. Uh, and so, I said. so heart failure, uh, heart can't pump fast enough or powerfully enough to empty its chambers. Uh, so what that uh, starts to get into is uh, something that we've talked about before, uh, which is ejection fraction, right? Uh, so that's something that they'll actually monitor. Uh, if you have a heart failure patient, they go to their cardiologist every year. Uh, and one of the things that they're taking a look at is that ejection fraction, right? EF. And so if their ejection fraction is 40% uh, on an ultrasound when they're taking a look at the heart and they're taking a look at uh, how much blood is coming into the heart and then how much blood is the heart pumping out on the other side. And so as that ejection fraction uh, drops, right, as their heart failure condition gets worse and worse and worse, uh, at 40% in this case, 40% means of all the blood that's coming into the heart, the heart's only pumping out 40%. Uh, which means we have 60% of that blood is backing up somewhere, right? And then that's where we say it's either backing up uh, systemically, if it's the right side that's having issues, or it's backing up into the pulmonary circuit, uh, if it's left-sided, or both, if it's really, really severe, they just got fluid backing up everywhere. <clears throat> All right, so that's what I was saying. So uh, this person has an MI, uh, we come along, oxygen, aspirin, nitromorphine, get them to the cath lab. We stop that MI process from continuing, you know, so that they don't code because of it. Uh, but now uh, the lingering effects that they have is the heart failure, right? Now they have that weak, uh, damaged left ventricle uh, that just doesn't pump very well, right? Uh, so that gets back into our cardiac output, right? It doesn't pump well, right? So it's not pumping out blood sufficiently. Uh, and remembering back to, to this one from, gosh, I think all the way back to the anatomy and physiology chapter, 
Uh, stroke volume is how much blood uh, gets pumped out in a single beat. So in a single contraction of the heart, how much blood does it pump out times their heart rate. Uh, so in heart failure, that stroke volume uh, is usually diminishing, right? Uh, because of that MI, because of that infarcted dead tissue, uh, now it just doesn't pump out as much blood. So the ejection fraction is lower. That's not pumping out as much blood in a single beat. Uh, maybe the heart rate is increasing to try to compensate for it. It's one of the things that the body can do to try to deal with uh, maintaining a sufficient cardiac output to perfuse uh, the important stuff. Uh, so if the stroke volume is dropping because the heart can't pump well, uh, the body will compensate by trying to uh, go tachycardic to just try to use the rate to overcome uh, the issue. Uh, so it can be uh, caused by any condition that affects preload, afterload, contractility, or heart rate. Uh, so preload is uh, the pressure of the fluid coming into the heart, right? Fluid coming into the heart. How much pressure of fluid, how much fluid is coming into it? Uh, so if it's a decreased preload, right, there's less fluid pressure coming into the heart. Uh, that could be severe dehydration, right? It could be widespread vasodilation, right? Like we give nitroglycerin, right? That reduces preload, right? There's less fluid pressure coming into the heart, right? Sometimes it's an actual lack of fluid, dehydration or hypovolemia or uh, hemorrhaging, right? The, the pressure of that fluid coming into the heart could be caused by not enough fluid or it could be caused by the pipes being too big. The dilation uh, could cause it as well. Uh, afterload uh, is the pressure that the heart pumps against, right? Pressure the heart pumps against. And afterload is entirely dictated. Let me separate these two. Uh, by vasoconstriction or vasodilation on the arterial side, right? So if the blood vessels are constricted, right, smaller pipes mean it's a higher pressure, right? So the heart has to pump against smaller pipes. So it's an increased afterload. Uh, vasodilation, again, like nitro, nitro also decreases afterload uh, because the heart has to pump against a lower pressure if those pipes are much bigger. There's just not much resistance to it if you have big uh, dilated blood vessels. So preload is more, uh, more so driven by the fluid amount, but it can be what the blood vessels are doing. Afterload is pretty much only limited to what the blood vessels are doing. Uh, so heart failure can also be uh, affected by contractility. So like the MI that we said, just the infarcted, weak, uh, damaged left ventricle. Uh, it has less contractility. Uh, so that's going to uh, uh, have worse of the heart failure signs and symptoms. <clears throat> and then rate as well. Uh, so your heart failure will be uh, worse if your heart rate is lower, right? Because that's just going to drive that blood pressure lower and lower and lower. And our cardiac output for these patients, we said, is already down, right? So their blood pressure is already lower or it's heading that direction. So if the heart rate's lower, now the heart rate is also contributing to that drop in blood pressure uh, and the failure of the whole system. Right? Um, so it could be that the MI was right-sided and caused, uh, the MI was right-sided and caused the bradycardia. Uh, it could be uh, maybe the medications that they're on, like our LOL drugs or beta blockers. Right? Maybe somebody has a little bit too much beta blocker on board or their, their body isn't tolerating it as well. Uh, so that beta blocker has been building up and building up and building up in the system. And that's also going to lower your heart rate. Um, so that's certainly possible too, uh, to be impacting just the severity of your heart failure uh, symptoms. <clears throat> All right. Another one, Starling Law or Starling's Law. Uh, sometimes they say Starling's principle or Frank Starling's law or Frank Starling's principle. Uh, just 
be comfortable with that. Those are all of them. Uh, that's one that uh, I believe I, has come up before with some stuff, uh, but it's the whole concept that the heart kind of operates like a rubber band, right? Uh, the heart muscle fibers stretch, right? Uh, and if they stretch out more, they're going to have a harder contraction back, just like a rubber band. If you stretch out a rubber band just a little bit, let it go, it's going to contract just a little bit. If you stretch out that rubber band really far and let it go, it's going to snap back much, much more, diff uh, much, much uh, harder. Uh, so the heart works the same way, and that's the Starling's principle, which is if you stretch out the heart muscle fibers more, and we stretch it out by filling it in, filling up the heart with more blood, right? So if more blood goes into the heart, the heart's gonna stretch out more, and then the heart's gonna pump more strongly, more forcefully to pump out that fluid. Uh, so this results in an increased cardiac output. Again, just the strength of that contraction is stronger, so it's gonna pump out more blood. So stroke volume will go up uh, in response to this. So again, it's Starling's Law or Starling's Principle or Frank Starling's Law. Um, again, the, the best visual I have is the rubber band, right? Stretch out a rubber band more, it's gonna contract harder. Stretch out the heart more, and in order to stretch it out, that means you're filling it up with more blood. That means it's gonna contract harder and pump it out the other side. <clears throat> All right, left ventricular failure or LVF or left-sided CHF is another way that we can say it. Uh, most common cause is going to be your MIs uh, and it's most common on the left side just because that's most commonly where our MIs are located is in that left ventricle. Uh, so way more often for uh, adults and the average person that uh, is going into uh, our CHF or heart failure patients most all of them are going to be left-sided because they have that MI on the left side uh, just because of its commonality. <clears throat> Excuse me, geez. <clears throat> Other common causes, uh, if the heart valves are uh, faulty and specifically on the left side, uh, we're talking about the mitral bicuspid valve. Uh, if that side uh, is having an issue, that means if we have our atrio and our ventricles, that means the ventricles are pumping blood back up into the atria instead of out the aortic valve to the body, which means our cardiac output, you know, monitored by our blood pressure systemically is gonna be dropping just because at least some percentage of blood flow is going back up into the atria instead of out to the body. Uh, cardiomyopathy, uh, we said just as that muscle gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it starts uh, impairing the mechanical pumping process of it. Um, excessive volume or pressure, right? So just chronic hypertension can just put too much pressure, too much stress on that left ventricle. And eventually that left ventricle is just going to get tired of dealing with that high pressure. So it has the potential to fail that way as well. Uh, but most common by landslide is just our MI patients, uh, and they have that MI, so they have that infarcted tissue on the left ventricle. Uh, right side continues to pump normally, right? So right ventricle is pumping blood to the lungs just fine, and that blood is going into the left uh, atria and then the left ventricle. Uh, so if the left ventricle starts failing, that blood is going to work its way back up into the left atrium and then back up into the lungs. And that's where you're going to get your pulmonary edema that starts setting in. Uh, just because that fluid is going to start building up and backing up and backing up and backing up in the lungs. Then eventually that fluid pressure, the pressure of that backed up blood in the pulmonary capillaries is going to be higher than the atmospheric air pressure that we're breathing in. So pressure is gonna go high to low. So that fluid pressure starts squeezing some of the fluid into the alveoli. Uh, so that's where we get that pulmonary edema uh, because that left ventricle failed. Means blood backs up in the left atrium, backs up from the left atrium through the pulmonary veins. And the pulmonary veins, it keeps backing up until it gets down to uh, the alveolar level. Okay. <clears throat> so there's uh, again a kind of 
more elaborately laid out uh, process for what's actually dealing with that. But again, it's all conceptually the same thing. Uh, left uh, sided failure goes to the lungs, causes lung issues, and oxygenation becomes impaired uh, just because once we have uh, that pulmonary edema that starts building up in our capillaries, uh, gases just don't dissolve well through a bunch of fluid. Right? That's one of the gas laws. Uh, gas does not dissolve well through fluid. So there's less oxygen coming in and there's less CO2 getting out. So they become uh, more and more and more hypercarbic, right? hypercarbic. Or if we were looking at end tidal CO2 or if we drew a blood gas, right, that CO2 level is increasing inside their body. Uh, if we're retaining carbon dioxide, uh, is our pH going to be high or low? What do we think? If we're retaining a bunch of carbon dioxide in the system, be low. It'll be low, right? It'll be acidic, right? Because remember, in the body, carbon dioxide, dioxide becomes carbonic acid, right? That's why I say CO2 equals acid, right? It becomes carbonic acid when it mixes with the water inside of our body. So if we're retaining more and more and more CO2 because it can't diffuse into the alveoli, so we breathe it out, then we're gonna become more and more acidic, which is a lower pH. Good, so a bunch of people chimed in with that one, good. So remember for that, less than 7.35 is our magic number for it, less than 7.35. All right, right-sided heart failure or right ventricular failure, you can use either of those terms, both are fine, right ventricular failure or right-sided heart failure. Uh, the number one cause, is left-sided failure, right? If the left side fails and it backs up into the lungs, now there's a higher and higher and higher pressure that the right side has to try to pump against, right? If everything is backed up into the lungs and the lungs now have that high pressure, right? High pressure and congestion in our pulmonary system, right? If there's high pressure inside our lungs, now that right side is pumping against a brick wall, right? That right side is not used to working very hard, right? That left ventricular wall is a lot uh, more developed than the right ventricular wall. So now the right ventricle that normally is very easy job is just pumping blood to the lungs, right? Now it's pumping blood to the lungs, but the lungs are filled up with all of that pressure because that left side failed. Uh, so your number one cause uh, for your right-sided heart failure is the left side already failed, and now it's putting more stress on that right side. And now if the right side's not failing, that's, or is failing, not working well, that's where we said blood backs up into the right atrium, right? And then it backs up into the superior vena cava, and we get our JVD, and it backs up into the inferior vena cava, and we get our pedal edema, right? Or sacral edema, right? We get that lower body fluid back up, right? Uh, so that's the side that we see. So now if we have both right and left sided heart failure, right? we have fluid coming into the right uh, atrium and right ventricle. Is the right ventricle pumping out much blood to the lungs if the right side has now also failed? What do you guys think? If the right side has failed, is it pumping much to the lungs? Good, no, it's not. So if both have failed, if we have right-sided heart failure and left-sided heart failure, we'll see the right-sided signs and symptoms more so than we'll see the, the pulmonary symptoms. Because if the lungs, or if the right side can't pump much to the lungs, for then that blood to come back to the left side, for then the left side to fail so that it backs up into the lungs is just a little bit less likely. So once the right side is failed, or once something is impacting the right side, even if it's cardiac tamponade or tension pneumo, is restricting blood flow 
into the right side of the heart, you're gonna see, again, more of the right-sided heart failure symptoms and less of the pulmonary edema uh, left-sided failure signs and symptoms. Right? So again, once you get right side or both, what you see again is the right-sided failure. Uh, you know, what we'll be able to assess and evaluate in our patients. Lungs might sound pretty clear, uh, but we'll have the JVD and the pedal edema uh, because of it, because of that right side's involvement. Yeah, so that's the description of uh, what we just said. So backs up, right ventricle backs up to the right atrium, uh, right atrium backs up into the body. So veins, the inferior vena cava and the superior vena cava is where we see it on that side. Uh, on the organ side, the first place that we will see it is in the liver uh, or have the potential to assess. Uh, you might palpate the liver and the liver is almost like bulging out uh, it's because the liver has been engorged with so much back blood uh, that we see the, the liver enlargement uh, because of that blood backup. So that's the organ that we'll see it in before some of the other organs. Uh, fluid buildup in the abdomen, uh, specifically the abdomen, we have the term ascites, it's an ascites. Um, the ascites that we see probably a little bit more commonly some of our like you know bad alcoholic patients you know have that really enlarged uh looks like a, a beach ball uh abdomen uh just full of fluid right it's fluid backing up so uh a little bit more common potentially in some of those severe alcoholics uh but anytime we're getting fluid backing up in the body if it starts backing up in the abdomen regardless of the cause we give it that term ascites uh, fluid backing up in the pleural cavity, we call pleural effusion. That'll come back up in uh, chapter 16 next week when we do respiratory emergencies. Uh, that's if we have our chest cage and we have our lungs, right? We have all that space between our lungs and the rib cage, the wall, the pleural cavity. Uh, and so if fluid started building up outside the lungs, inside the thoracic cavity, inside that pleural cavity. We call that a pleural effusion. Uh, that's where they'll go in, they'll put a big needle into that pleural space and they'll draw out all the fluid that's in there. Uh, pericardial effusion, similar thing. We have that pericardial sac uh, wrapped around the heart, so fluid can build up uh, around there as well. Uh, we uh, don't use this word too often, anasarca. Uh, that's the kind of more formal medical term for just generalized edema. Um, weirdly, with all the medical terminology and stuff that we use, uh, the generalized edema is kind of the one that we use. There's actually a more formal name for it, which is that anasarca. Um, you just, like, for whatever reason, I don't know why, but for every reason, we just don't see that term uh, come up very often. But that would be the term for generalized edema. All right, core pulmonal, right? and without any other idea, just pulmon, right? That's telling us something to do with the lungs, right? And so in this case, it's right-sided heart failure caused by an issue in the lungs, right? So core pulmonal, right-sided failure caused by a pulmonary disease. Uh, maybe it's COPD. Maybe it's uh, the pulmonic valve has stenosed where it's narrow. Uh, and that's making the right side have to work hard because it can't pump that uh, blood into the lungs right? or conditions like pulmonary hypertension where the pressure inside the pulmonary arteries is really, really high for whatever reason, puts a lot more stress on that right ventricle than the right ventricle is used to. And it can push you into right ventricular failure. It's just caused by a pulmonary issue, right? The heart, structurally can be pristine, right? There's no MI, not, nothing on that side happened. There's no cardiac issue. There's an issue in the lungs and the right side responds by having to work harder, right? And the right side is just not gonna tolerate having to work hard for too much time uh, before that right ventricle starts failing because of the workload. So core pulmonal, 
is a good term to know. Uh, again, it's right-sided heart failure caused by a pulmonary issue. Uh, and just the prevalence of COPD is kind of one of the, the number one causes of it. Just that obstructive issue in the lungs uh, just puts some added pressure onto the system and makes some added pressure that that right side has to try to pump against. All right, compensatory mechanisms uh, is stuff that we've been talking about a lot. So anytime that body senses that it's under duress for whatever reason, uh, it starts releasing that fight or flight response, right? Epi gets released throughout the body. Uh, and so this is all the stuff that we uh, talked a little bit about yesterday. Um, beta one effects, right? alpha effects, right? All of those uh, uh, sympathomimetic or sympathetic nervous system response, all designed to try to say, hey, the system's not doing great and it activates that response. Um, unfortunately, in the cardiac emergencies, right, the response is to make the heart pump faster, pump harder, right, increasing the pressure on the system. So when the issue is the cardiac effects, the compensatory mechanism actually makes those problems worse, right? Because if the issue is the heart's not working too well, now we're making that heart that's not working too well work even harder, require more oxygen uh, and pump against the higher force. So it starts driving those issues to be worse and worse and worse than they, uh, than they normally are. All right, so this way it's in again. And this goes into physiologically what the body is doing when that fight or flight response activates and it releases epi. Uh, but then also as we're transporting the patient, we said just the stress and anxiety, right? It's gonna make the person's heart rate uh, increase. Uh, it's gonna get them uh, going a little bit more stress-wise and that raises the oxygen demand, which now means that heart that is already deprived of oxygen, now it needs more oxygen to keep functioning. And right? so those problems get worse and worse and worse. Coronary artery perfusion starts dropping, less blood is coming into the ventricles, right? It's coming in as more slowly. Uh, which means cardiac output starts dropping, blood pressure starts dropping, cardiac uh, irritability, irritability, right? Cardiac irritability starts increasing, which means dysrhythmias, you know, like VTAC is what's coming next, right? And it's all just because uh, that continuation of stress on the heart is just exacerbating the problems that's making it get worse and worse and worse. Okay. All right. Renin angiotensin aldosterone system, or the RAAS, uh, will come up again in a couple weeks uh, when we do the GU renal chapter. Uh, and talk about the renal emergencies. That's where we'll really review the anatomy and physiology of how the kidneys actually function. But uh, at its core, what's going on is we have baroreceptors inside the body, right? So inside the carotid bodies and the aortic arch are the two main locations for baroreceptors. Uh, those sense that the blood pressure has dropped and basically tells the brain, hey brain, uh, blood pressure is getting too low. And the brain says, okay, cool, blood pressure is too low. I know how to deal with this. Let's try to raise the blood pressure by releasing some epinephrine, right? Vasoconstrict and increase heart functioning. So that's that other slide. Right? That's one way that the brain says, okay, let's try to deal with this. Uh, and then the other thing that it's gonna say is, it's gonna tell the kidneys, uh, hey, you know what? Don't pee anymore. Right? Because we need to retain all the fluid possible in our system. Uh, we can't, you know, our blood pressure is already dropping. We don't want to get rid of more fluid. We don't want to pee anymore. So let's shut down those kidneys. Right? Let's shut down that urine formation process that's going on. So the brain sends that signal down to the kidneys. Okay? And that signal is this RAAS system. Uh, and like I said, that we're going to get into it a lot in that renal chapter. And we've had a decent bit of anatomy and physiology these last two days, so I'm not going to emphasize it right now. But the sequence of steps is a variety of hormones. 
it's the renin gets released first, triggers aldosterone, and then the other one, the other A that's in there is angiotensin is the other one. So renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system. So that hormone sequence uh, eventually tells the kidneys to shut down, right? And so we don't keep uh, peeing. And so if we're not peeing, all that means is we're retaining that fluid inside the body, right? Which is ideal because the whole core issue that's going on with this patient is that drop in blood pressure. So the body's gonna say, hey, we need to do everything possible that we can to raise our blood pressure. So vasoconstrict and let's pump our heart faster and stronger. Uh, let's shut down our kidneys to retain fluid there. And then one of the other interesting ones that will come up in this is the thirst mechanism, right? Which is uh, if you've ever had that, you know, trauma patient, shock patient, and all of a sudden they're in the back of the ambulance and saying, I am just really, really thirsty, right? I'm sure a lot of you probably have that experience or like, yeah, actually weirdly, I have had a lot of patients tell me that they're thirsty. Uh, that's the brain also trying to say, I can try to increase my blood pressure by triggering that conscious thought and that sensation of needing to be thirsty. So that hopefully my body drinks more, brings in more fluid. So now we're vasoconstricting, we're pumping the heart faster, we're shutting down the kidneys and we're thirsty. So we're trying to drink more and add more fluid into the system, all to just try to bolster up uh, our blood pressure. Uh, so these compensatory mechanisms, we're talking about them uh, in the context of this chapter with cardiovascular emergencies, but this is the same compensatory mechanism for all of our shocks, regardless of the cause, right? If it's a GSW and the person's bleeding out, well, the baroreceptors are going to pick up on the fact that blood pressure is dropping because we're bleeding because we got shot. And we're going to vasoconstrict and pump the heart faster. We're going to activate that renin angiotensin aldosterone system to shut down the kidneys. And we're going to trigger that thirst mechanism. Uh, so the, this compensatory mechanism loop uh, or just sequence of things that the body is going to activate right away to try to save itself is going to come up over and over and over again. Uh, the whole cardiac uh, sympathetic nervous system response, this kidney response, uh, the thirst mechanism response are all just various ways that the body immediately is going to try to start uh, protecting itself, right? Try to start compensating for whatever the issue is. All right. So this will work for a while, right? but eventually... Right? It's a compensatory mechanism. We can't stay uh, functioning in that system for a long time, right? We can't just all be walking around all amped up with the sympathetic nervous system uh, kicking and just epi coursing throughout our body all the time. Uh, we're going to fry ourselves out that way. So it's a compensatory mechanism. It's not a long-term solution, which means depending on how bad the condition is and how quickly it's advancing, is gonna dictate how well the compensatory mechanisms are gonna be able to uh, try to deal with the problem and how long they're gonna last, right? So the more severe the issue uh, or the quicker uh, it's happening, the less likely that these compensatory mechanisms are even gonna work in the first place, or if they do work, they might not last very long. And that patient will start uh, shifting from compensated shock uh, down to decompensated shock, right? And that one we're really looking at now, that blood pressure, right? We were stabilizing it for a while with all of that vasoconstriction, contractility, all that stuff. We were stabilizing our blood pressure, but now the problem is just, the, the problem is winning, right? The fight of our body is losing. And so that blood pressure starts dropping as these compensatory mechanisms start failing. All right, so assessment, uh, some of the symptoms, uh, it depends on if it's right-sided uh, or left-sided, right? So we've talked about the JVD, we've talked about the pulmonary edema, uh, some of the other stuff, uh, trouble sleeping, right? Or if we go back to our orthopnea, right? Ortho is positional, 
the PNEA is referencing breathing, right? Those are those patients that they sit, uh, they sleep every night in the recliner or they sleep with a whole bunch of pillows behind their back because if they lay down, that pulmonary edema fluid just spreads out over their lung field, uh, which is gonna make it just more difficult uh, for them to breathe. So they're all the time, they're sleeping upright, uh, they're staying upright, uh, they get really uh, bad difficulty breathing as soon as they lay down, as soon as you get that change in position. All right. Good, and again, a bunch of different uh, possible diagnoses. Uh, when we get uh, another handful of weeks, when we get to our AMLS, a uh, little two-day certification from the NAMT, it's advanced medical life support. Uh, it's all uh, designed to just keep you thinking first and foremost with a broad list of possible causes. And say we have chest pain, what could it be? Well, chest pain could be everything on this list and more. Right? And then as we get more information, we start assessing our patient, we can start ruling certain things out. We can say, well, there's no, uh, there's no pulmonary edema, so that's not the problem. Right? So that one's off our table. Um, we're not climbing Mount Everest. We don't have a high altitude issue, so that one's it. Uh, we get a set of vitals. Uh, there's no uh, fever and the lungs are clear, so it's not pneumonia. I've got good bilateral breath sound, so it's not a tension pneumothorax. Uh, could still be a pneumothorax, right? Uh, but it's not a tension pneumothorax. Uh, I don't have any signs and symptoms of an allergic reaction. I don't have anything indicating to me that there's potentially toxins, right? So it's just as you work your way through all of your ABCs, all of your sample history, all of everything, you just start ruling it down, ruling down, ruling down until eventually you say, Hey, based off of all of the signs and symptoms that I've had, my assessment, the 12 lead, all of it, I think my patient's experiencing cardio, or cardiac tamponade. That's my differential diagnosis. Because I've assessed, I've done my full assessment on my patient. I've done all my detective work that I have with the tools that I have. I've narrowed down my list. I feel pretty strongly that it's cardiac tamponade. And then you can you know, shift over to your protocols. And you can say, okay, do I have a cardiac tamponade protocol? No okay, that means I'm just managing blood pressure and shock symptoms and getting them to the hospital. Right? That would be that sequence for it. And that's how AMLS works. Those two days, there's almost no lecture in AMLS. It's just case studies. It's literally first slide is here's your dispatch information. And then we start working our way through slide by slide by slide as we get a little bit more information and we start refining that differential diagnosis. I really like the AMLS class uh, a lot. All right, so on heart failure, the, the goals, right? manage our ABCs to the best extent possible, right? Do we need to innovate? Is it a pulmonary edema issue that we want to do CPAP? Do we not have CPAP? So we need to do our pharmacologic intervention for heart failure and try nitro, Lasix, if you still work for a place that carries Lasix. Uh, is the problem getting worse, but I don't have CPAP, so I may have to RSI my patient and use that positive pressure ventilation, right? Remember, both of those, the whole reason why those work is the positive pressure, right? That positive pressure is going to push that pulmonary edema fluid out of the alveoli back into the bloodstream so that we can get good gas exchange happening again, right? Uh, so it depends on what's going on. If it's right-sided heart failure, right, and that blood pressure is dropping, uh, we're gonna cautiously try fluids, right? We have a low blood pressure, so fluids is where our mind goes, uh, but by adding more fluid to a heart failure patient, it's gonna make that heart work harder and that's gonna exacerbate some issues too. So we might try a little bit of fluid, but we're gonna be very, very careful with it. Uh, we could potentially get to the point of trying a, a presser, like dopamine, right? Yeah, we can do a dopamine or epipressor for shock, uh, and that would help. Uh, but it'll also, you know, that's a double-edged sword as well, right? By giving a uh, vasoconstrictor like epi or dopamine, that's also going to make the heart work harder. And again, the issue is the heart is failing. So it really becomes a fine line that we're walking of trying to do a little bit to make sure that our blood pressure doesn't 
bottom out and they code, but not much because too much of it will start to uh, make the problem worse as well. So we really have this kind of narrow little window that we're operating in and it's difficult to teach because it's so variable exactly just depending on well, what is that blood pressure? Is that blood pressure uh, 84 over 60 and my patient is ANO times four? Like, I'm okay with that. I mean, 84 is low, but the patient's still mentating, so I feel a little bit better about it. Or is my heart failure patient, you know, 68 over by palp, right? We can't even get the diastolic number. You know, that's really bad. We need to raise that blood pressure up because they're altered and we're at risk of just bottoming out entirely. Uh, but I don't want to raise it up too much because, again, that's going to now start to make the problem worse. So we're really, again, we're walking a fine line uh, with these uh, CHF exacerbation patients. All right. So position of comfort, again, oxygenate, uh, 94, you know, again, that's these cardiac ones. A lot of the times the numbers they like you to use is 94 to 99% for your SpO2 monitor their breathing effort, uh, get a 12 lead, right? Make sure it's not a active happening MI, right? Uh, and then pharmacology, uh, potentially just depending on what your protocol is, right? Um, it's one that maybe the protocol says do CPAP. Maybe the protocol has Lasix. Maybe the protocol says just BVM, positive pressure ventilation. That really kind of depends a little bit. Um, there's a, a few different avenues that we can take for these heart failure patients. They say, without lights and sirens for transport, again, just because the added stress and anxiety that the patient's gonna experience, know that they're you know, bouncing around the back of the ambulance, hauling ass down the road uh, with the lights and sirens going, is gonna stress them out more. That's gonna increase that heart rate, increase that oxygen demand. So you wanna keep that uh, as calm as possible, uh, getting the patient there, uh, in as uh, timely a manner as, as you can while doing it as calmly as possible. Uh, another one, just depending on just how bad that failure is, uh, maybe they say, you know what, the whole heart is failing, you know, the ejection fraction is 10%, right? It might, it's barely doing anything at all. There's so much damage, it's so weak, it's not able to pump anything. You know, of all the blood coming into the heart, the heart's only pumping 10% out. So blood pressure is just in the toilet. Everything is down. This person needs a heart transplant, right? That's what they need. They need a heart transplant. Uh, that's going to take time, right? Uh, most of the people don't, don't get to the point where it's, I need a heart transplant, boom, here you go, right? They go on that transplant list, and that's going to take some time. So what they uh, are doing more and they're uh, you know, driving it a lot more now are these ventricular assist devices, uh, right? So it's a mechanically uh, implanted uh, piece of equipment uh, that has an external battery pack, usually on like a fanny pack or something that they carry with them. And there's the power cord that kind of goes through their abdomen that charge, that is driving the power to this ventricular assist device and it's pumping the blood through the body, right? So left ventricular assist devices, or if you've heard people say LVADs, right? those are the most common, again, just because the most common issue is left-sided heart failure. Right? That they could do a right-sided one or both uh, if possible, but left sides are your most common. Right? And this is what it looks like. Uh, pretty much from here uh, and up is inside the body, right? And this is the power cord that's outside of the body, right? So there's usually a bandage covering there where the, the cable uh, goes into the body uh, and it plugs into uh, the power source, right? And that power source uses like gun holsters, right? Those are our batteries, right? Um, spare batteries and everything. So the battery uh, is generating the power that is going uh, up into this unit here, and there's a zoomed in picture here in a second, and you have one piece of it that is implanted into the left ventricle, right? So this might be actually 
uh, inserted into our left ventricle. Good. And what it does is it drains or it allows uh, the blood to come out through there into the mechanical pump part. And then that part now drives the blood flow here. And then this is hooked up to the aorta, right? So the right side still in this picture, the right side still pumps the, the blood to the lungs right? to get oxygenated. And then that blood back into the left atrium, down into the left ventricle, out the hole in the bottom into the mechanical pump, which then pumps it into the aorta. Right? And so the left ventricle is not actually contracting or doing any work whatsoever. Right? Uh, this bit of equipment with its power source uh, is serving as the left ventricle. It's driving the blood throughout the body to actually keep the patient alive and perfused. Instead, I think I've got a closer picture here. So this is the part that is implanted into the ventricle. And then this part, like I said, hooks up to the aorta. So blood drains out from that left ventricle into the tube, right? And then inside uh, this vent is the motor and almost like a turbine on a big ship, right? This thing in here is just spinning, right? It's just spinning around and like a jet is pushing that blood through that tube into the aorta and circulated throughout the body, right? This is that power source that goes down to the fanny pack that the person's wearing uh, to give this uh, system the power. Uh, but yeah, this part, uh, again, just like a turbine, is just jet stream uh, pushing that blood with enough power to be able to circulate it throughout the entire body. Uh, the original LVADs uh, were continuous stream, right? which means this just nonstop just kept spinning. Right? Uh, so these patients would have no palpable pulse. Right? Because it's just like a garden hose, right? There's no ebb and flow of pressure, which is how we actually feel a pulse, is the ebb and flow of that pressure of blood moving through. So these original LVADs were just, but again, like the garden hose, it's just a continued stream of blood. And if all you have is a continued stream, you have a single pressure, you never actually feel a pulse. So these patients would be, ANO times four talking to you, no palpable pulse whatsoever. Right? So those are the original ones. Those are still out there for sure. Uh, and it's crazy. It's wild if you ever get to talk with one of those patients and be like, hey, do you mind if I check a pulse? <laughs> and you check a pulse and you're talking to the person, you're like, there's no pulse. This is crazy. Right? It's because this LVAD is one of those continuous stream ones. Uh, now, the newer ones, uh, you know, just as they get better with technology and they figure out uh, that they can do these, now they have pulsatile ones where that turbine is still in there and some of them are magnet driven that it spins a thing with magnets. Um, so there's a couple different styles of them. Uh, but now that turbine kind of pulsates with it. So it pushes blood through, slows down, pushes blood through, slows down, pushes blood through, slows down. So that generates a little bit more ebb and flow so that there's a higher pressure and a lower pressure, which means we can palpate that. Uh, so these a little bit more naturally mimic what the body is used to, as opposed to just the garden hose of a continuous blood flow uh, LVAD. Um, these continuous ones, uh, just because it's just constant pressure on the blood vessel walls, eventually can actually start to cause some blood vessel damage. Just because blood vessels, again, naturally for healthy people, blood vessels are used to the dynamic pressure and relax. Pressure and relax. And these continuous ones, it's just pressure, 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 pressure. There's no relaxation. So eventually, those blood vessel walls are going to start getting irritated and damaged by that. Um, and it comes with the territory. But the newer ones, these pulsatile ones, uh, again, they at least have a little bit of relaxation, uh, which means that the blood vessels are going to tolerate it a little bit better for 
for a little bit longer. Um, but these continuous ones, uh, if there's no high pressure and low pressure, uh, then you're going to press uh, for a blood pressure on your monitor and it's just going to keep cycling and cycling and cycling and cycling. It'll probably never give you a readout uh, just because there's no, you know, pulse, right? If we look at a manual blood pressure and you see that little needle toggling down, right? And this, there's just one pressure. So if you were doing a manual, you'd eventually see it toggle, or you'd eventually see it blimp once, just once it picked up that pressure. Um, the number that you would get for that little needle jump, that one needle jump that you would get on a manual blood pressure, would more closely be a MAP pressure. Um, it wouldn't be a systolic, it wouldn't be a diastolic, it would be closer to a MAP. Um, not exact, because MAP is calculated based off the difference in systolic and diastolic, so it's not, it's not a MAP, don't mistake me there. Uh, but it, it conceptually is a little bit more like it of just what is that average pressure that's being exerted on the blood uh, blood vessel walls. Um, any questions? I mean, LVADs are are a crazy thing. Um, they're really uh, intense. Um, there are patients that are on these for a long time right now. Uh, they're you know. They're better technology. We're able to deal, uh, treat these patients a lot better. Um, and so these patients are on them longer and longer while they're still on the heart transplant list, all right? It's not that they're gonna have it, I mean, they could have it for the rest of their life, but ideally, eventually we get this person a heart, uh, which means they'll uh, detach this from the ventricle and the aorta and they'll put in the new heart and attach you know, the new heart to all the blood vessels and everything that they need to be doing. Um, but these uh, LVADs are kind of that stopgap while they're uh, on the transplant list and we're just trying to keep them alive. I have one more picture. No, I don't. Um, so yeah, any questions on the LVAD? Again, uh, like DHS is trying to encourage us to, to do it a little bit more often, uh, the training. Um, you know, it's obviously in your books and everything like that. I just pulled a couple images uh, off the internet last night for some of these uh, LVADs. Um, but the more kind of exposure experience, even just conceptually you can get to them, the better. Um, the, uh, you know, fanny pack part, if we went back to this one, uh, these, you know, somewhere on, you know, the batteries or whatever, uh, somewhere on there will be a phone number for their LVAD uh, coordinator, right? Uh, and it'll be whatever hospital put them in, if it's Banner University, there'll be a phone number that'll go to a very particular person, right? And so if you assess this patient and you at all think that this ventricular assist device is what might be going on with the patient, find that number on there and give them a call. And then they'll walk you through assessing to make sure the ventricular assist device is working. Because uh, if you have one of these continuous ones with no pulse, and if we find this person unresponsive on the ground, are they dead? Or is that LVAD still working and circulating blood? Right? We'll have, we have no way to figure that out. Right? Now, if they're still oxygenating well and skin color is still good, then that tells us that it's probably working. And if they're gray and cyanotic and, and terrible looking, we're thinking at the very least, the, the LVAD may still be working. They may just not be oxygenating well. So that's a possibility. It could just be a, a oxygen problem. Uh, but you find these patients, again, pretty much immediately find that phone number for that ventricular assist device coordinator, find that phone number and give them a call. And then somewhere you know, on the device, somewhere, there's usually uh, error codes. There's usually, uh, you know, it might be beeping or something like that. And you can just start talking to that coordinator and saying, it's saying error 504. And they'll say, okay, that means the batteries are dead. Right? Change the batteries. And uh, they'll say, you know, take a battery out of wherever, plug it into wherever. Like they'll walk you through how to troubleshoot it if possible. Uh, and anything unique on treatment or whatever, uh, they'll say, they'll tell you what to do. Uh, we're not going to do chest compressions on that, 
unless a ventricular assist coordinator says do chest compressions, but that's not likely. Uh, there's just so much hardware in here that if we go on there, we start pounding on the chest. Uh, we're just going to be, you know, tearing apart what they just think about what all that uh, all that uh, mechanical stuff is doing to that heart tissue. We came along and we're just pounding on it, right? So everything for these ventricular assist device patients uh, becomes troubleshooting and making sure that that ventricular device is still working. And that person will walk you through it all and they'll tell you where to go and what to do. So just get on the phone with them. Um, a lot of these patients usually will have uh, the ones that I've interacted with uh, usually have like a backpack or something with them with a bunch of spare batteries. Uh, and they're very particularly about bringing that backpack with them because that's their life source. Right? If that ventricular assist device fails because the battery dies, their heart fails. Like they're not perfusing anything anymore. They die. Uh, so I was at a EMS conference a year or two ago. And they had a big ventricular assist device section of that seminar. And there was three or four uh, people that were there uh, that came to be a part of it that had ventricular assist devices implanted and, and functioning. And so we were able to actually talk to them and learn about a few different manufacturers uh, devices. And they, uh, you know, one of them was done for the day. And I was just, you know, helping them carry some of the other stuff and everything out to the car. I was like, hey, you want me to carry that backpack for you? They're like, no. But it, was a, it was like it was an immediate shift just in mentality because that backpack had their batteries in them. And they didn't want anybody else to touch that backpack because that they know that that backpack has their life source in it. Um, so they're very particular. Uh, so if you get a car accident patient or a trauma patient or something like that and, you know, expose their chest and we see, uh, we see the battery pack and we see this wire that's going in and being implanted in their app. And we're like, that's a ventricular assist device, right? One of the things that we uh, have to do uh, is find in the car, you know, that backpack, this batteries and everything. We have to take the extra minute on scene to find that uh, and bring it with us to the hospital because uh, it's, it's just something that's not going to uh, help. Uh, we also don't have the batteries uh, moving forward. So, cool. so very interesting with the all that. Um, O2 readings, SpO2 should pick it up, right? We should get an SpO2 reading, right? Blood pressure. We said we won't get like a automatic blood pressure. It won't likely ever really pick for us. Uh, but putting a SpO2 on them. Right? The, the blood is still being circulated and the hemoglobin is still being oxygenated. So we should be able to still see an SpO2 reading. Uh, so that could help us differentiate if we're thinking uh, the patient dead because we can't palpate a pulse, but they have an LVAD, so it might still be working. Uh, O2 reading, SpO2 can definitely help in tidal as well, right? as long as the patient's still breathing, right? Uh, in tidal. Uh, can help as well. Or if we start bagging the patient, we can hook them up on the antidote. That can be another thing that's telling us blood and oxygen is being circulated so that uh, so that we're able to get carbon dioxide to the lungs to be able to breathe it out. So SpO2 and antidote are still good uh, assessment tools. Heart rate, potentially not. Uh, and blood pressure, we said potentially not. Uh, can you see, does the L on an EKG have a pacer spike? Uh, it's not a dumb question. Uh, and there's no pacer spike because it's not, uh, we don't have an external source uh, like that guide wire, you know, going down and implanted into the heart, generating that electrical impulse that travels throughout the heart. Uh, so we don't get, you know, a pacer spike rhythm or anything like that. Uh, electrically, the heart may still be doing what it was doing normally. Just we know mechanically the heart is not pumping well enough. So you may still see some sort of, uh, you know, rhythm on the monitor. Uh, we just, it's mechanically, it's not working. Electrically, uh, it could still be happening. Uh, but yeah, there's no pacemaker. So we're not gonna get that pacemaker spike. 
uh, and the ECG, we'll see whatever the heart's trying to do, right? As long as, I mean, enough of the cells are still alive that we're still getting the electrolyte calcium channels and stuff opening and closing, which means we're still getting the movement of those electrolytes, uh, which means we'll still see whatever sort of rhythm is there. Uh, we're just not, I don't care what rhythm shows up, right? I care about if the LVAD is working to be able to circulate uh, that blood throughout the body. Right? That's the most important thing for us right now. All right. So cardiac tamponade, uh, we said fluid uh, builds up in that pericardial sac and starts putting pressure on the heart, right? So if we have the heart, we have our pericardial sac, right? We get more and more fluid, starts building up in the sac, starts squeezing on the heart more and more. So it restricts the amount of blood that can enter the heart, which means less blood coming in, which going back to that Starling's law, Starling's principle, less blood coming in means it doesn't expand that much. So less blood in means it's a weaker pump. So it's a lower contractility. Right. Lower contractility. Resume sharing. Sorry. There we go. Uh, lower contractility uh, means. There we go. Sorry. Back here. All right. So lower contractility. Uh, contractility. Lower contractility, uh, decreased cardiac output, right? Uh, so cardiac tamponade is going to mimic the signs of the right-sided heart failure, right? Because if no blood or very minimal blood is coming into the right atrium because of all of that pressure being squeezed down onto the heart, means that blood is going to back up into our superior and inferior vena cava. Uh, so that's where uh, we'll get one of uh, our Beck's triad, right? One of the Beck's triad is JVD, right? It's because of all of that pressure squeezing down on the heart. It means it's squeezing down on the left ventricle, but it's also squeezing down on the right side. And since that pressure is squeezing on the right side as well, it means it's going to back up just like the right-sided ones back up. So you get the jugular venous distension. Uh, you also get a uh, second one is muffled heart tones. Right? And so if you were listening, if you got good at listening to heart tones, uh, then you could, uh, what you would be doing is you'd be listening, trying to hear those valves closing because that's those heart tones, right? We're listening to those valves closing, but now it's blocked by a bunch of extra fluid in that pericardial sac, right? So everything's constricted, so it's pumping more weakly. And we're trying to now listen to that weaker pump through a bunch of fluid. So it becomes a lot quieter, a lot more difficult to hear those heart tones. And then the third one of Beck's triad is narrowing pulse pressures. Right? Narrowing pulse pressures. Right? And that's where the systolic gets lower and the diastolic pressure stays elevated. So you get weird like 84 over 70 blood pressures, right? The top numbers and the bottom numbers are getting closer together, right? That's a narrowing pulse pressure is what they mean by that. Uh, and that is because if the heart is just so constricted because of all of that pressure squeezing on it, the high pressure contraction phase is minimally different than the low pressure relaxation phase just because of all of that outside pressure being squeezed on the heart. So there's very minimal high pressure and very minimal relaxation. So systolic and diastolic get closer and closer together. And they generally go on the lower side for the hypotent or for the systolic blood pressure. So that it goes narrow and lower, right? So hypotensive and closer together systolic and diastolic numbers. Uh, you also get with the drop in blood pressure, you know, some of your normal shock signs. Right? Uh, something somewhere is not going to get enough perfusion because of the low blood pressure. 
So cool, pale, clammy skin, uh, tachycardia to try to compensate for it. Uh, you'll get increased respirations uh, just to try to get more oxygen into the system as well. Uh, depending on just how bad that systolic blood pressure is, maybe weak or absent peripheral pulses. Uh, remember, most people lose a radial pulse. Most adults lose a radial pulse below about a systolic of 90 or so. Uh, so depending on how bad it is, you might not even be able to feel that radial pulse. And then pulses paradoxus is on a beat to beat basis, you might get a strong beat and a weak beat, right? A strong pulse, weak pulse, strong pulse, weak pulse. And that's just that heart moving within that big, you know, water balloon of pericardial sac surrounding it, that fluid starts moving around with it as that heart tries to start contracting. So fluid shifts and then everything else uh, shifts as well. Uh, electrical alternance is on the monitor. You see a big QRS or a big spike and a little bump. Okay. Big complex, little complex, right? So it just continues that, that uh, big electrical beat, little electrical beat, big electrical beat, little electrical beat. Um, and again, that's just related to as well, that heart moving and all that extra pressure and all that extra fluid around it. Uh, management, pericardiocentesis, right? So the issue is we've got fluid building up in that pericardial sac, so we gotta get that fluid out. Uh, whether that fluid was caused by uh, cancer or an infection or something else, right? That fluid has to come out. Uh, so what they do is they get a big needle and they go up under the rib cage and get that needle to puncture the pericardial sac, and then they're able to withdraw fluid uh, off of there. Uh, Teresa said, does it have to be every other or could it be too small than one big complex on the ECG? Um, it depends. Uh, I mean, it's all dictated by just how is that fluid moving in the pericardial sac. So eventually it starts to form some sort of kind of rhythmic pattern a little bit unless the patient starts moving a lot. So I think generally it really does start to show up every other. Um, my guess is it could at least be possible that it could be something like every third complex uh, could be small. Um, I think more often than not, I think they will say that it's every other uh, complex for it. Right. Uh, cardiogenic shock, right? Uh, so that might be just a, a progression of that MI patient, right? As that MI keeps getting worse and worse and worse, and that blood pressure starts dropping, Eventually, we say, well, we still have that problem, but now they're also in shock, right? Uh, so just that contractility has just weakened so much uh, that we're getting our normal shock signs of hypotension, uh, tachycardia probably to try to compensate for it, increased respirations to try to get more oxygen in the system, cool, pale, clammy skin, altered mental status, kind of our normal classic uh, shock progression uh, for our cardiogenic uh, shock patients. So very similar to other shock types. Uh, hopefully we just have some sort of history uh, or involvement with that patient that says, uh, you know what, they were complaining of chest pain before this started, uh, and now here's how we found them, and they look like they're in shock. And we're going to say, okay, those two are probably related. This is probably a cardiogenic uh, shock. All right, so O2 IV monitor. Uh, it says rapidly infused, just a little bit of saline. Right, so 100 to 200 milliliters of saline is not much fluid, uh, but if it's cardiogenic shock and there's potentially some heart failure uh, symptoms, we really got to check those breath sounds because we're worried about fluid backing up already. Whether the fluid's backing up into the lungs or the fluid's backing up into the body, we're worried about that fluid backup. So we want to give them a little bit of fluid to see how they respond, but really we want to give them a little bit of fluid. Right. Just try a little bit and see how they respond. These are those patients that we want to keep their blood pressure okay so that they don't bottom out and tank, but we don't want that pressure to be too high uh, or even elevated or even normal, normal tensive. We don't want it to be too high because that's going to put too much workload and demand on the heart as well. So a little bit of fluid as we kind of walk that fine line of trying to, to treat the patient to the best of our ability. As a worst case, uh, again, we could get to the point of, you know, a presser 
Uh, but again, there's both of those pressers are going to put so much workload on the heart, so much pressure on it that it risks uh, causing problems uh, as well. It'll help them, but it'll cause some problems. And we really start to play that risk, risk benefit calculation, which is we can't just continue to watch that blood pressure dwindle down to nothing. Eventually, if it's not responding to the little bit of fluid, then eventually we have to do something to kind of raise that fluid, uh, that pressure up a little bit. Uh, and even if something like dopamine will cause some damage to that sick heart, uh, dealing with some more damage to a sick heart is better than them coding. So it's really one of those ones where it's like, we're gonna cause a little bit of issue, but we're trying to keep the pressure up so they don't code. And that's a little bit more important in the moment. Uh, so that's how we can justify uh, getting to some of these medications that will actually make their problem uh, a bit worse. All right, recheck our IV sites for sure uh, and transport to the hospital. Um, so like I said, these sections start kind of flying through a lot more. Uh, so hypertensive emergencies, uh, most classically, they look at the diastolic pressure, right? Uh, we know systolic, right? We know that number. That's the one that we talk about the most. Uh, but when we get to uh, kind of diagnostic things for hypertension, like our chronic hypertension patients, it's a sustained residual increase in that relaxation diastolic pressure. So if the relaxation phase for the patient is becoming elevated, that's worse. That means we're never giving that body that downtime in between that high pressure contraction and that weak, the lower pressure relaxation diastolic. We're never getting that relaxation because that diastolic number has been creeping up too. So when they say your diastolic starts rising and hitting 90, uh, that puts you into a uh, kind of clinical diagnosis of that hypertension uh, territory. So chronic hypertension, uh, shortened lifespan, predispose you to other medical conditions, the arteriosclerosis that'll start happening, the pressure uh, that that's making the left ventricle pump against, you know, is gonna predispose those patients to that left ventricular failure. That left ventricular failure is going to progress to right ventricular failure, right? And that's just, it's going to start snowballing, right? It's those chronic conditions that become harder to fix in the future, right? When something happens acutely, you know, the body reacts very strongly, but we can usually just as quickly get them back to healthy, right? If it's been this chronic buildup of an issue, we can't just correct that overnight, right? That's been chronically building up for years, potentially with chronic hypertension. So it becomes much more difficult to try to correct that and bring it back down and not have kind of some uh, residual, you know, complications that the patient might be experiencing. So hypertensive emergency, kind of that acute spike up. Uh, and that's where, you know, sometimes you'll see, you know, people with you know, 210 over 110 blood pressures, right? Just crazy high, but that diastolic is also elevated. Uh, headache is gonna be your most common symptom, uh, just of having that significant high blood pressure. You know, they feel it in their head, so they may have some dizziness. Uh, nosebleeds are a bigger one uh, as well, just so much pressure in the teeny little blood vessels in your nose uh, that you risk bleeding. Uh, tinnitus is another one, right? Tinnitus is uh, ringing in your ears, right? So that's another one, right? So it's a lot of head stuff, right? Look at the headache, dizziness, nosebleed, ringing in your ears, blurred vision. Uh, most of the time, the hypertensive ones are worried about their head. We're worried about them rupturing little blood vessels in their brain and having a hemorrhagic stroke uh, secondary to that high blood pressure. Uh, so for us, uh, we don't generally get too active uh, on the hypertension emergencies. So we do our normal ABCs, O2 IV monitor, right? O2 IV monitor, right? nothing special there. Uh, maintaining SpO2, 94 or better. Uh, otherwise, that's about it. And usually we're just rechecking our blood pressure, see which way we're training or trending. Uh, getting them to the hospital uh, so that they can more carefully, gradually bring down uh, their blood pressure. Uh, inevitably, paramedic students usually ask, me, well, could we give them nitro? We know nitro lowers, lowers blood pressure and the blood pressure is the issue, 
So nitro makes perfect sense, right? Let's lower that blood pressure and see how they respond. Uh, the issue with nitro is it'll drop their blood pressure a little bit too much too quickly, right? And when we get that rapid shift in blood pressure, we risk, you know, causing some fluid shifting and stuff to happen. Uh, so for us, we don't give nitro uh, for the hypertensive emergencies, you know, unless your medical director has, you know, a hypertensive protocol that allows it, then I guess so. But uh, generally speaking, uh, I don't know of any place that really uses uh, hypertensive uh, emergency with nitro like that. Um, maybe though, especially if you go critical care or flight, use some of those LOL drugs, those beta blockers, right? Beta blockers are prescribed for our chronic hypertension patients because they lower the heart rate, which in turn lowers the blood pressure. So it does everything a little bit more gradually and safely. Uh, those become great drugs that flight crews might have a hypertensive emergency protocol in which they use a drug like labetalol. Uh, or in the hospital, they may start something like labetalol where they a little bit just more gradually bring down the blood pressure as opposed to that really precipitous drop that we would get uh, potentially with nitroglycerin. All right, infectious disease of the heart. So endocarditis, right, is inflammation. Itis is inflammation of the endocardium, so the inner lining of the heart. Uh, occurs when bacteria in the bloodstream starts to just colonize, right? That bacteria starts growing and staying on the inside of the heart, right? So a bloodstream infection, right, is our sepsis patient, right? Or if you wanted to say that bacteria, that infection is in the bloodstream, you could say septicemia. Sometimes you'll see that term, right? So we have this bacteria toxin that's just circulating throughout the body. Uh, and now maybe some of that bacteria starts, uh, you know, growing and, and, and exacerbating an infection specifically on the inside of the heart, like on the valves or something. That'd be, uh, classically called endocarditis. Um, highest risks, people with valve problems already, prosthetic valves, aortic valve disease, mitral valve disease, right? So valve problem patients, uh, congenital heart disease, right? Their heart has already uh, been through a lot just with how it naturally developed that those patients are more at risk for uh, the infection to start causing further issues there uh, inside their heart. Uh, severity depends on exactly what uh, is causing the issue. But again, with the uh, itis, the inflammation, right, there's some sort of infection, right? So we get our infection signs and symptoms, right? This time we're just uh, honing in that the infection is actually lodging and, and growing and continuing inside the heart itself. So depending on what, uh, what the organism, what the infection is, right? Antibiotics, right? It says surgery in severe cases. Maybe they have to do valve replacements or whatever because they got so diseased because of the infection uh, that it uh, potentially caused some issues there. Uh, Casey, what if a patient has empyema? Um, what do you mean? Uh, can you clarify that question for me a little bit? Uh, what kind of treatment can we do for for the endocarditis? Uh, it's really, I mean, for any of these patients, the the protocol that we would push into or the treatment that we would push into is just dealing with the infection, right? So for us, that's usually fluid boluses, uh, potentially pressors, right? Otherwise, our normal ABC shock treatment, uh, but really, you know, what they need, they need the antibiotics, they need to get to the hospital. Uh, if the problem has gotten so bad that the tissue uh, inside there has been so damaged and diseased for, because of the infection, then potentially surgery. But uh, other than our normal ABC management, uh, for us, we're usually down in the uh, IV fluid and presser uh, territory form. All right, pericarditis, right? So the last one was endocarditis. Now we're um, pericarditis. So this one is the inflammation or irritation of the pericardium, right? So the outside uh, outer layer of the heart and the sac that surrounds the heart. 
Uh, caused by viral, which they say is most common, bacterial or fungal. So at the hospital, they'll you know do a, a blood draw and try to figure out what is the causing the infection, and then they'll give antivirals, antibiotics, or antifungals, uh, just specific to whatever is causing the issue. Uh, NSAIDs, right, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug NSAIDs, uh, are generally just kind of the run of the mill. Let's deal with the fever. Uh, and inflammation. Um, so that's kind of a, a first line one, not something that we're likely going to get into the treatment of it uh, either. It's uh, get them to the hospital so they can identify what is causing the infection and then they'll go about treating that specific infection. Uh, one that's interesting, so this is a uh, 12 lead on a pericarditis patient. Uh, there's, uh, well, I'll let you guys kind of take a look at it first before I keep talking. Uh, and you guys can kind of let me know what you see and what you, what you think about this. Yeah, you know, carry ST elevation everywhere. Right? That's one of the big ones for identifying uh, pericarditis is global ST elevation. Right? ST elevation. And there's our baseline, ST elevation. There's our baseline, ST elevation. Baseline, ST elevation. And AVL is actually down. Right? V3, ST elevation, V2, ST elevation, V1, maybe not, V4, ST elevation, V5, ST elevation, V6, ST elevation, right? So this is one where this person is probably not having some sort of anteroseptolateral inferior MI, right? Their whole heart is not infarcted. <laughs> we have ST elevation everywhere, right? So global, you know, across the board, just sweeping every lead just about has ST elevation is one of the big 12 lead findings that can tell you uh, my chest pain patient, because this person is going to be complaining of some chest pain, right? Uh, this chest pain patient uh, is not the entire heart is infarcted more than likely. Uh, it's the lining around the heart, that pericardium is inflamed and irritated. And so it's, it's resulting in the irritation of all of the heart tissue. So all of the leads start showing up with the uh, peaked T waves. Right? So people are saying tacky, 300, 150, 100. It's actually probably 90, right? Our heart rate's probably 90 there. So not particularly tacky. Um, but the global ST elevation is one of uh, the big one with pericarditis. Um, that's the one that uh, most people, they remember the global ST elevation for pericarditis. Uh, the other one is uh, depressed PR segment, right? So you can kind of see it uh, a little bit, you know, down here where maybe that's a little bit lower you get a little bit of a drop in our pr segments right so if you kind of exaggerated it what would happen is you get a depressed pr segment and an elevated st segment right so if we just followed our baseline over right? the exaggerated visual would be depressed pr segment and elevated st segment um, the depressed PR segment is a little bit more difficult to see on any of the leads, uh, but the ST elevation everywhere is one that uh, one that we really pick up. All right, so peaked T waves as well. So remember, if we split our 12 lead down the middle, we're saying peak T waves on this side have to be greater than what? Anybody remember the number I said on that side? 
Good. Good. Yeah, peak T waves on this side, greater than five little boxes. On this side, greater than 10 little boxes. Okay. So if here's our baseline, right? Five boxes is here, okay. uh, which means, whoa, whoa, whoa. Sorry, sorry, sorry. All right. Uh, there's that. Five little boxes is there. So we definitely have more than five little boxes. So we have peak T waves. On this side, 10, which even if we're saying that's the baseline, uh, that would be five. That's pushing pretty close to 10 boxes there. Uh, so good, on the left, the five little boxes. On the right, you got 10 boxes. So that's, that's definitionally the peak T waves. That's how you evaluate that is remembering on that side, it's five, on that side, it's 10, right? Five on the left side, or yeah, five on the left side, 10 on the right side. Now, the question in this one becomes, is this patient uh, having uh, hyperkalemia or are the T wave repolarization, repolarization issues secondary to the irritation of the heart? Uh, and the likelihood uh, on this, is probably it's an irritation of the heart uh, is skewing the T waves to be peaked like that. Uh, but whether you think it's potassium or the irritation, they are definitionally peaked just because they uh, exceeded five little boxes on that side, uh, they exceeded 10 little boxes on that side. So good pickup on that one too. Good job, guys. All right, myocarditis, uh, again, very similarly, uh, inflammation of now the myocardium. So we had endocarditis for the endocardium, pericarditis for the pericardium, and myocardi myocarditis for the myocardium. Again, same thing. They're going to have to figure out what's causing it and then, uh, you know, give the antibiotics or antivirals or, or whatever it is that they need to, to treat that infection. Uh, for us, uh, we're just at uh, most going to be on our sepsis protocol, uh, which is largely supportive. Uh, but again, if anything, uh, just to kind of keep hammering home the important parts, uh, fluids and pressure support. Uh, so your dopamine uh, or something like that, potentially. And then always, right, we're always obviously going to have these patients on the monitor and be keeping an eye out for a dysrhythmia. Uh, if a dysrhythmia occurs, we're going to treat that dysrhythmia if we have a treatment for it. We just know uh, at the source of why their heart went into a dysrhythmia is the infection in these cases if we picked up on the infection signs. Uh, rheumatic fever uh, causes mitral valve stenosis, which is, like I said, that's just a restriction of the opening through the mitral valve, right, which means less blood is going to be getting uh, from the left atrium down to the left ventricle, right? Just because it's a narrow, narrower opening there. So we're going to have less blood flow getting through there. Uh, it's inflammatory disease caused by strep. Right? So if somebody has strep throat, if that streptococcus, uh, streptococcal bacteria gets into the bloodstream, uh, potentially it could go to the heart and cause issues. So even if you have strep throat, uh, you're actually at risk of uh, rheumatic fever of that uh, infection spreading uh, down to the heart uh, and starting to cause issues with um, some of your, your valves. All right, scarlet fever is another one caused by that streptococcus uh, infection, right? Sore throat, fever, rash, and then strawberry tongue. Right? So again, in these medical chapters, if I said, if you were making flashcards of saying, okay, scarlet fever uh, caused by strep, uh, on one side of the flashcard, and then on the other side of the flashcard, you're like, okay, sore throat, fever, rash, strawberry tongue, right? Strawberry tongue would be the big one that would key us into the scarlet fever, right? So you're looking for what are the unique signs or symptoms for helping you support a particular differential diagnosis, right? Sore throat, fever could be a lot of things. Rash right? could still be a lot of things. Strawberry tongue is a very specific thing that they use and then describe for scarlet fever. Right? So it's a good way to kind of look at 
uh, some of these disorders. Uh, treatments include antibiotics, right? It's a bacterial infections. So we need antibiotics at the hospital, which means our care is largely supportive uh, and uh, supportive care in fluids. A strawberry tongue, uh, particularly red, right? If you looked at your patient's tongue and it it was, and it just like at all triggered a thought of like, that tongue looks really red, right? We just say that like, that's what it would be. So particularly red uh, for the tongue. Uh, aortic aneurysm, right? Aneurysm and dilation or outpour, outpouching of a blood vessel wall. Uh, greatest are concerned with those obviously in the aorta, right? So an aneurysm anywhere is not good. We're worried about that blood vessel rupturing. Uh, if it's happening in the aorta, right? Just the aorta is the biggest artery. It's under the most pressure. So if it ruptures, there's rapid blood loss really, really quickly and a high fatality rate if it actually gets to the point of rupturing. So acute dissecting aortic aneurysm, right? The dissection is if we were looking at the aorta, and we had this outpouching there, and this is our aneurysm, eventually the inner lining of that aneurysm starts breaking down and that inner lining starts dissecting or starts tearing, right? And then the blood starts leaking into the middle layer and the middle layer continues tearing, dissecting, and then eventually the outer layer tears, right? And then it ruptures and you just get significant blood loss very, very quickly, right? Again, high lethality rate, obviously once it gets to this point, just because you're gonna bleed out so incredibly quickly uh, that it becomes difficult uh, to recover from that. Um, you gotta be basically on the operating room table if it ruptures to stand a chance of really having a, a, a positive outcome from that. Uh, it's just so much blood loss so quickly. Uh, the issue that's driving it is the pressure, right? The blood pressure. So we're not gonna wanna do fluid boluses for these patients uh, because adding more fluid is gonna add more pressure and potentially cause it to rupture. So if it's not ruptured yet and we're monitoring it, we're gonna keep them as calm as possible, keep their blood pressure down, right? We're gonna get some IVs established, but we're not gonna be running fluids because we don't wanna uh, make more pressure uh, in the system. Uh, and then if it ruptures and you see their blood pressure start tanking really quickly, then we've got some IVs established. We can start running some fluid wide open uh, to try to stabilize their blood pressure and drive insanely fast to the hospital, just try to get them there. Um, but very, very difficult. Uh, in the dissecting phase before it ruptures, the pain complaint, uh, you know, it's a tearing of that artery wall. So the pain complaint they'll say is a tearing pain, right? Usually it's a chest pain or between the shoulder blades. They say a tearing pain between the shoulder blades uh, should be that red flag one that sends your mind straight to uh, dissecting aneurysm, right? It's a, a verbal description that happens to match very physiologically with what's going on in the body. They say it's a tearing pain and literally the wall of the aorta is tearing open. And again, usually uh, between the shoulder blades. Mm -hmm. Cool. Can happen anywhere. You know, there's a couple of places that they say it's potentially a little bit more common, but it can happen anywhere in the aorta, um, all the way down to the abdominal aorta, which is where we get the triple A, right? Abdominal aortic aneurysm. It's all the same issues. Uh, is all uh, is the potential for rapid, uh, immediate blood loss. Uh, again, the descending aortic dissection again, the tearing pain between the shoulder blades uh, is a big one. And uh, good, 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 good table uh, for you guys, just to again, further help you with some differential diagnosing. Uh, here's a chest pain patient that they described to me. And then the question is, what's your differential? Is it angina? Is it MI? Is it a aortic aneurysm? Or is it a hypertensive emergency, right? They give you four cardiac emergencies, but then they just give you that description of the patient. You gotta figure out Based on the words that they're giving me and the vitals and everything, do I think it's angina, am I uh, aneurysm or something else, right? So it's a good one, right? AMIs are progressive. 
So that pain gets worse and worse and worse as more and more and more of that cardiac tissue gets deprived of oxygen. Uh, in dissecting aortic aneurysms, it's usually a lot of pain right from the start, right? It's not pain that really gets worse. It's once it's there, once it's happening, that pain's happening, right? It's not uh, developing over time. So it's usually quicker and stronger versus gradual and getting worse for the pain. Those would be very good, uh, the, probably the, the best two descriptors to help uh, differentiate them. Obviously the substernal crushing chest pain versus that tearing complaint between the shoulder blades is another great uh, bit that would help you say aortic aneurysm as opposed to uh, AMI. Uh, depending on where the aortic aneurysm is, sometimes you can get a difference in blood pressure between the arms. So if we have our aortic arch, right, and we have that blood vessel that goes to one arm, and we have that blood vessel that goes to the other arm, we have another blood vessel that goes up to the head. It's not exactly like that, but for the sake of the argument, run with me. Say if our aneurysm is here, right, as that blood moves through, right, in this instant, we have a bigger pipe. So that lowers the blood pressure, right? So some of that blood redirected down to that arm. There's a drop in blood pressure where that dilation is of the aneurysm. And then the blood continues with some of it going to that arm. So this arm has a lower blood pressure than that arm, right? So if you coupled the quick onset, really strong chest pain, tearing pain between the shoulder blades, and the right arm has a different blood pressure than the left arm, that can really, you know, that, that is the descriptor for your aortic aneurysm. Uh, it would still work if the aneurysm was there, right, because that would still lower the pressure, so that side would still have higher than, than that side. If the aortic aneurysm happened here, right down, then that arm and that arm are getting the same blood pressure, right? but then the blood pressure weakens there, which is why they say the carotid could have a higher blood pressure than the femoral, right? because we lose a little bit of that pressure there. Um, if we were able to more carefully measure the pressure of the carotid compared to the pressure of the femoral, we would get a drop there as well. Um, so it's all dependent on where is that aortic aneurysm is gonna kind of dictate uh, what we're talking about for a uh, potential difference in blood pressure. All right. So symptoms is all that stuff that we were just talking about. Uh, the blood pressure arms for it to really be uh, noteworthy is greater than 20 uh, millimeters of mercury between your systolic blood pressures from arm to arm. Um, so a pretty substantial. It's not that you take one blood pressure on one arm and it's 90 over 60 and the other arm you take it and it's 88 over 60. Right? It's not that type of difference. On one side might be 140 over 90 and on the other side, you know, it's 118 over 70 or something like that, right? There's a substantial difference in that systolic blood pressure. All right, descending aorta, we said, uh, uh, you know, less severe, potentially more common in our older patients. Uh, it lowers the blood pressure in the lower half of the body. So distal pulses like on your feet might be harder to feel. Um, they could rupture that aneurysm. You can rupture any of the aneurysms. Uh, so we're just being, again, we're cautious with anything that's going to impact uh, blood pressure. So pain relief, which is also going to lower blood pressure, which is good. IV establish, uh, but no fluids initially, right? Unless it really starts rupturing, and then in which case we're you know probably going to be given a lot of fluids. Uh, but we remember, we don't want to do anything that's going to raise their blood pressure more uh, because that's causing the problem in the dissection. So uh, we got to get them going to the hospital very quickly, very calmly, getting IVs established just in case it ruptures um, and just basically being ready to go by trying to get them to the hospital uh, to get them uh, to the OR, you know, if it's actually at the point of dissecting, uh, to get them to the OR to try to do uh, 
surgery there to uh, stop the process. Uh, last couple slides, uh, acute arterial occlusion or limb ischemia. Right? So if something is blocking blood flow in, uh, in a limb somewhere, right? whether it's a thrombus or right? an embolus because it moved, a tumor or trauma like compartment syndrome, just anything that's uh, blocking off blood flow um, is going to cause obviously some very common sense things, right? So if you cut off your arterial blood to your lower leg, you know that lower leg is going to be cold, pale, right? not be able to feel the pulse down there if the artery is actually occluded, right? And then uh, eventually over time, you know that tissue can start dying. Right? If it's not getting oxygenated blood circulating to it, eventually necrosis is going to set in. All right. So most common cause are those embolisms uh, or a clot, uh, you know, moved uh, down to the leg uh, and is cutting off arterial blood flow. Mm -hmm. And other conditions that can cause those clots, we know are AFib, right? Maybe uh, in that left ventricle after an AMI, right, that left ventricle is a little bit weaker, so that ejection fraction stopped. Uh, so we have a little bit more blood pooling in that left ventricle, and maybe some of that blood eventually starts to clot over. Uh, people with heart valve issues, oftentimes uh, could be and probably should be on some blood thinners uh, just to help deal with the uh, clot potential. Um, for sure. So definitely a, a few different things that can cause it. Um, like we said, trauma to either directly to an artery or trauma to the limb, uh, just causing that edema pressure squeezing on it. Um, for the vasospasm, uh, dissecting aneurysm in the leg, uh, it can be caused by they had to go through the femoral artery uh, to do the calf procedure in the lung and the heart to deal with the MI that the patient was having. Well, now we punctured an artery, so we risk uh, the damage to that artery, uh, potentially clotting over and occluding blood flow. Um, so yeah, lots of different things for sure. Um, some of the kind of more classic presentations, uh, pain, cramping in the extremity, weakness of the leg, uh, it may reside, it may come back. It should be. Uh, another slide coming up here that has the other ones. Uh, if the symptoms began suddenly, it's probably an embolus, right? Something got dislodged and eventually got stuck. So it causes the issues as soon as it gets stuck somewhere. Uh, if it just gradually occurs, it's that thrombus, it's that clot building up and building up and building up and building up until it eventually starts to block the blood flow. So it's more gradual, right? Try to, more gradual versus sudden, right? Is the clot moved somewhere else and became lodged versus it grew and stayed in place there? And the five Ps, and this one works well with um, compartment syndrome as well. I uh, got pain, got pulselessness just because it's restricting blood flow. Uh, if you're not getting that nice, warm, oxygenated blood, then the tissue is going to get pale as well. Uh, paresthesias or numbness and tingling, uh, sometimes just because of that pressure starts kind of twinging on the nerves that are running there as well. Uh, paralysis potentially, again, just depending on how bad uh, that pressure has been progressing in there. Uh, on the compartment syndrome with the pain, they'll usually say out of proportion to the injury. Right? So sometimes you look at it and it's like, their leg doesn't look that bad but they're like screaming in pain on it. And you're like, whoa, I did not anticipate that level of pain based off of how that actually looks, right? So pain out of proportion to the injury um, comes into play, like I said, a little bit more with compartment syndrome than just like an arterial occlusion in the leg. Uh, but again, that kind of potential extra descriptor of the pain uh, would be one of them. Our management. Uh, somebody's got to go in there and, and either dissolve that clot with a fibrinolytic drug or try to remove it somehow. Uh, so we got to get them to the hospital, right? It's, uh, it's very much, you know, the limb is at risk. 
is it's not getting good oxygenated blood, so we're risking that tissue dying, which means we got to get uh, blood flow restored to that extremity. Um, so we are on the clock for saving that limb, uh, but just like putting a tourniquet on, we know we can manage the, the restricted blood flow to an extremity because of a tourniquet, we can do that for a long period of time. We do have more time, uh, but still at, at the source of it, we do have a limb which is at risk. Um, and that's a big quality of life thing. So even though it might not be immediately life threatening, it's limb threatening, which also kind of bumps up our, our concern and the speed that we kind of operate in. So largely supportive in terms of our management and treatment, but uh, definitely something that we want to and need to get to the hospital uh, pretty quickly so that they can uh, get to work on making sure that they can save that plan and deal with the complications. Cool. Uh, so maybe pain meds, right? Keep the ambulance warm to uh, avoid vasoconstriction, right? They're, they're already dealing with poor blood flow. We don't need to cause vasoconstriction in that limb and just reduce blood flow even further. Uh, so, you know, that consideration is there. They say don't apply the heat pack, so, so don't try to cause the vasodilation. Certainly don't do cold. Uh, basically, don't do nothing. Just try to keep the ambulance warm, I guess, which is easy to do in Arizona. Uh, keep the ambulance warm, but mostly uh, potentially give them pain meds if med control says so. Uh, but just get them to the hospital. That's what we got to do for these patients, get them to the hospital. Monitor your five Ps. Um, again, another one, uh, high risk refusal, right? High risk refusal. So do your best to get them uh, going to the hospital. Otherwise, uh, get med control on the phone and say, hey, here's how their legs look and here's what's going on. Uh, they don't want to go, you know, but really do your best and uh, try to convince that patient to go. Uh, DVTs, right? the last little bit here. Uh, thrombophlebitis, right? thrombophlebitis, damage or development of a blood clot in an inflamed or damaged vein. So deep vein thrombosis or DVTs uh, are a more common one that we talk about. Uh, clot develops in the deep veins of extremities. So usually down in your lower leg, right? Usually in a calf is what they always say, down the calf muscle and those big veins down there. Uh, that clot starts forming down there. Right. It's on the venous side, so it's not cutting off blood flow to the extremity like the arterial ones, uh, but it's a clot forming in the vein, so you could get blood backing up below it. That would be possible. But really, we're worried about that clot uh, down in the leg getting dislodged, and it travels up the leg, up the femoral vein, up the inferior vena cava, into the right atrium, into the right ventricle and the right ventricle pumps it out into the lungs and it's a pulmonary embolism. That would really be the sequence of it. It's, it starts down in the leg and it works its way up uh, the venous side, which is gonna go into the right atrium, right ventricle and get pumped into the lungs and cause a blockage there. So that's the concern with the DVT is it's gonna get kicked loose and the next place, the next smallest vein, right? Because all these veins, starting wherever it formed in the leg, all of those veins get bigger and bigger and bigger until it gets to the little ones inside the pulmonary vasculature. Right. Uh, so three factors predispose the person to develop the thrombus. Uh, sluggish blood flow, venous stasis, damage to the blood vessel wall, clotting disorders. Um, they have clotting disorders are obviously potentially at risk of clotting. Uh, so those patients are there too. Uh, they might be seeking care because of swelling or pain or tenderness to the limb. Uh, find out if they have a history of them uh, or any risk factors like an elderly person that's been bedridden or has been immobilized for a long time. There are risk of those clots uh, forming. And then beyond the, just the risk of it being there in the first place, there's the added risk of it moving and that's where I said it'll get lodged in uh, your lungs. All right. Uh, so compare the extremities, see if there's any swelling, inflammation, uh, pain, tenderness, uh, for sure. Uh, look for pain on dorsiflexion of the foot, so if you are flexing the foot, uh, and that pain is increased there, then it can help support the idea that there's a clot building up in the legs. Um, but otherwise, don't do anything. Don't give your patient a leg massage. 
right? As much as I'm sure love, many patients would love a nice leg massage, we're just not gonna do it, right? Um, so just get them to the hospital uh, so they can be evaluated there. Uh, treatment for us is supportive, other than just continuing uh, to monitor that patient. And if out of the blue, the patient tells you they have spontaneous pinpoint localized chest pain and difficulty breathing, uh, then we're like, uh-oh, that clot just got dislodged and now it's in the lungs. All right, transport with all of these, they're saying if the patient refuses, try your best to persuade them, right? These are just high risk refusal patients. Um, those patients really need to be evaluated at the hospital. Whew. And that is the end of that chapter.